This is in public communication. We will receive public communication for both the Eastern Crescent Subcommittee and the Strategic Planning Committee before we proceed to the subcommittee agenda. Members of the public who wish to make comments during the public communication portion of this meeting must have registered with Central Health via the online form or by telephone no later than 11.30 a.m. today. Is any, did anyone register to make comments? Yesenia, were there any comments? There were not, no, nobody had registered for it. Okay, given none, we will now proceed to the agenda. Uh, before we proceed, I see your hand, uh, Manager Dollar, ask you have a question? Yes, no, I actually registered. What happened is when I dialed that 9190 number, a uh, recording came on that was transferred me to a different number, maybe like an 841 or 8 something else. And I left a message saying, this is Cynthia about all this. I would like to register to speak, uh, not not for the public uh, input session, but rather in public uh, communication prior to our meeting. Uh, I did that maybe at about um, 1042, 1046, something like that this morning. Okay, so if it's your desire to speak, I have no objections to that. I guess my question is, uh, uh, Mr. Duncan, is there any problem with having a board member use the time? Sure. That's that's fine. Okay, so you have up to three minutes. Mike? Mr. Greenson, do you have a comment before we call on? Uh, no, what we'll do, and thank you, Manager Valdez, for letting us know that, um, given that information, we'll circle. What I would suggest for both chairs today is that we circle back around as staff troubleshoots um, why we didn't pick that up. And then perhaps you know allow additional time towards the end of the meeting or at the end of the meeting. Just to Thank you. I, I appreciate that. I just I didn't recognize that additional number it, because it was it was not a nine seven eight or something like that. It was like an eight four one or whatever, eight five one, eight seven one, something like whatever. Okay, so just tell me when I you want me to speak. You can go ahead and proceed, and it's my understanding that after the end of three minutes, uh, your voice will be cut off automatically, so you have a <laughs> three minutes. Well, hopefully it'll take less than three minutes. Uh, one of the things that I did speak to Mike about is my, my extreme concern over the increase of the Delta variants showing up in our neighborhoods, in our, in our, in our neighborhoods, in our communities, uh, here in Travis County and the surrounding area. Uh, I don't see that slowing down it may not be at a rocket pace right now but i would like for us to uh, make sure that we do a comprehensive and concise messaging in as many languages as possible to explain what the variants are why they are caused uh, and clearly explain to the public that we are not doing testing for the delta variant uh, in listening to what the travis county commissioner said yesterday they are doing only the minimum that the CDC recommends, and that is passive uh, surveillance, not uh, a, a, a multiple kinds of surveillance that would give us a better attitude, or a better understanding and better data as to where the variants are, uh, the people uh, are getting sick in what neighborhoods, especially in those where there is a high incidence of COVID, those high risk zip codes. So if there's anything that we can put together, and I guess I'll be looking at Ted uh, for communication purposes as, a, a, as an enterprise to make sure that the public knows about these things and understands uh, that they, if they go to the doctor, ask the doctor to send us their uh, test off, COVID test off, if they're continuing to have breakthroughs uh, and make sure that it does get tested and then what those protocols are. You know, a one cheater, half a cheater, something very simple. That's the first thing. The second thing is to ask this board at some point in time, as quickly as possible, to support what we're, there's a group of us that are asking, that Travis County be a site for testing of the variants, for the mutations, the different sequencing, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, we know that since UT is already doing some modeling work, we'd like for us to concentrate our efforts on that since we already give them 35 million dollars a year 
it would be very easy for APH and the other entities to come into play and target them. Biden has agreed to put out $1.7 billion, and we would support some of that coming to UT Medical School and to help us, uh, all the healthcare agencies and our residents, especially for us, our, our disadvantaged, marginalized communities, uh, non-English speaking populations, and uh, those like, uh, one of my other organizations is ADAPT, uh, those that have uh, immune compromised issues, medically fragile people. So those are my two requests, uh, and, and I appreciate y'all letting me have this time, and I'm committed to keeping this message or sending this message everywhere I go, including our meetings whenever we have them from now on. Thank you. Thank you very much, Amanda Gabella, and I think those are excellent points as well. So I'd just like to echo those. With that said, we will now proceed to the subcommittee agenda. Um, item number one is to review and approve the minutes of the November the 11th and December the 9th, 2020 meeting of the Eastern Crescent subcommittee. It seems like it's been a while since our last meeting, uh, but these are the minutes that I have uh, that we have indicated. I move that the subcommittee approve the minutes of the November the 11th and December 9th, 2020 meeting of the Eastern Crescent Subcommittee. Do I have a, a, a second? A second. No, I'll second it. Thank you very much. I, I have a second. Uh, are there any questions or any discussion? Not seeing any. All in favor say aye. Aye. All opposed say nay. Any abstention? Not seeing any. Okay, we move to item number two. Review and discuss updates on Eastern Travis County service expansion. We'll hear from us, uh, Ms. Stephanie McDonald, Margarito Flores, and Rachel Ronjo will be presenting. Manager Jones, I apologize for interrupting. This is David Duncan, uh, Travis County Attorney's Office. I, I just wanted to point out that we're having some uh, issues with Ring Central. Uh, a recent update was downloaded to Ring Central, and it has, even though uh, Brianna is the owner of this meeting and is running it, she doesn't have any controls. So the chat feature is on. I urge all the members not to use the chat feature um, because it causes problems with uh, compliance with the Open Meetings Act. Um, and we're also having trouble recording if we're doing an offline recording uh, through our IT department. So again, apologies. We're working on that in, in the background. Um, thanks. Okay, thanks very much. Sir? Uh, um, Mine is there, yes, if, if we can ask, if I can ask David, if, or, or if you can ask David to find out how long we have had this problem. Is it something from yesterday or just today? Uh, not, at, not at this minute, but just to know for, for uh, future purposes with respect to Green Central. Yeah, we don't, we, this is the first meeting certainly that this has been a problem, but there was an update run and, and IT thinks it might've been related to that update. So we'll, we'll let you know okay. when we find out. Thank, Thank you, Manager you. Melodis. It, it might also be helpful in our prep meetings for these if we knew we're having these challenges, we could have been given a heads up that could have been helpful. We didn't know till we started the meeting, sorry. Oh, okay, all right then, thanks very much. With except, that said, uh, except for me calling in and saying we were having technical glitches. On the phone. I don't think I don't think that was related to Ring Central. It's okay. a, that's that's this platform. Sorry. Thank you. That's okay. Ms. McDonald. And I'd like to yield to um, the present CEO for the minute. I believe he wanted to start off. Yes. Okay. Thank you very much. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. So, members, you'll receive a, an update on the service delivery expansion. And speaking to one uh, component of this, which is the scopes and types and uh, modalities of delivering service, it's not necessarily related to the facilities per se as a matter of urgent care. This question first came up in this subcommittee meeting. Um, there is an agenda item that's posted for the strategic planning committee meeting, which immediately follows this subcommittee meeting. But uh, urgent care, as you all know, is a completely different type of business model. and where we're focusing on uh, delivering primary care. We have urgent care contracts and other partnerships to, to provide that front urgent care. Um, this is something that, meaning urgent care, is, is a matter and a subject that needs to be discussed within our larger strategic systems-based and equity planning 
uh, which we will get to. We'll have a little bit of a precursor conversation, uh, again, a strategic planning committee, but uh, been bringing something that's much more robust back to uh, the strategic planning committee uh, in subsequent meetings. So I just wanted to point that out. Um, and, you know, happy to, happy to field any questions at the end of this presentation uh, in that regard. But, but again, there is a much more, there's, there's a bigger conversation to be had around urgent care uh, in this coming meeting, but also even bigger in, in subsequent meetings. Thank you. Thank you. And now, um, it is my distinct pleasure to give you an update on our work to expand healthcare delivery locations in Eastern Travis County, specifically in Hornsby Bend and Del Valley. And before I turn it over to Marguerite De Flores, who has joined us as a senior project manager, um, I would like uh, to remind you that Rachel Hardegree um, moved uh, from Central Texas and um, we were really um, honored to work with her in the service planning area especially. Uh, Margarito has kind of picked up and run with the ball. Um, we, uh, Margarito, if you don't know from his previous stint with us, was a practice administrator with community care for a number of years and um, has really been able to take us across some very significant um, milestones this summer. And I would like to, before I hand it over to him, really acknowledge that although our bench is not very deep, um, there is an unlimitless amount of talent and dedication to these projects. Um, I really do want to commend uh, Rachel Taranjo, who has served as the owner representative project manager in the design. We have reached um, significant milestones in both the site plan um, applications as well as construction documents for both projects. And we'll tell you a little bit more about that. Um, just because the presentation is not very long um, does not mean that they haven't a lot of people working very fast and variously this summer, including our procurement team, the Travis County Attorney's Office, our contract, we have a couple dedicated folks on our, who help us with contracts. And I you know, cannot thank everyone enough on our um, engagement team. So Margarito is going to give you an update about these two projects. Um, we will like to give you a little verbal update on Colony Park. And then of course, if you have any questions, we're here to, to help answer any questions. Margarito. Hi, Stephanie, thank you. And uh, first of all, good afternoon to everyone. Um, I am so glad to be here. And as Stephanie mentioned, I just recently joined the, uh, the ETC team. So I'm very glad to be able to provide you guys with some updates. So first of all, thank you guys for your time. And uh, as Stephanie mentioned, I really wanted to just provide you really two uh, kind of um, major items that we'll discuss first. So first of all, I want to provide you guys with the, the project updates on really taking a look with, on what is some of the work in progress that the team has been focusing on during the month of July, but also wanting to go, go ahead and look ahead and really take a look at what are some of the major milestones that we expect, not just for the remainder of August, but also looking ahead into September and early fall. After I'm done kind of with this slide, I'll go on to the next one, which I'll kind of go ahead and outline this into a timeline, and you'll be able to get a high level of visual of kind of where we're at. So um, once again, just go ahead and starting with some of the work in prog progress. As Stephanie had mentioned, really the team has been working very diligently on ensuring that we have our CSP ready to go in order to obtain some bids. And of course, as uh, Stephanie mentioned, we've really been working very closely with our legal team, procurement team, Rachel Toronto and the real estate. And we're very proud to say that we have made some tremendous progress. And as you'll see in our next slide, one of our uh, projects for the Forest event has actually gone live. So once again, very exciting news about that. The other work in progress that we've been really focusing on has been on the construction documents. And I cannot say enough once again about the tremendous work that has happened with that. And once again, we're working with Dan and, and Rachel Toronto and this really been a monumental task. And it's been something good and uh, that will allow us to be ready for our next phases with the site plans and also building permits and things of that sort. So once again, that's been going on um, currently. And of course, lastly, we've been working on our uh, site plan review process with the city of Austin and also working with Travis County on that. So we'll go ahead and uh, uh, once again, a lot of good work. Now, as we go ahead and look ahead, we do have some uh, major milestones that we're hoping to accomplish, not just for the month of um, August, but also taking a uh, look into September. And uh, once again, we are expecting to finalize our construction do documents and get them approved. We are also expecting our CSP solicitation to go live. And once again, I'll go ahead and provide that here in the next slide. Um, we are also looking at email communication to the stakeholders 
Some of you may not be aware, but we did send out an email communication at the end of July, and we are expecting that to occur at the end of August as well. So once again, some work on that. In the month of September, we are looking at the board approval, looking to have a contract awarded, and then of course, looking ahead into having a groundbreaking event. So uh, something that we'll go ahead and uh, look at into the next slide. Can we go on to the next one, please? Great, thank you. And as you could see here, um, as I mentioned before, uh, the team has really been doing a lot of work in the month of July with getting the preparations. Oh, Mr. Mr. Flores, uh, I'm sorry. We're hearing background noises from somebody's uh, speaker. Could you please mute your speaker if you're not presenting? I'm asking whoever this is to mute your speaker. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. Sorry, Mr. Flores. Thank you. Thank you so much. So once again, as we mentioned here in the month of July, we enjoyed the communication with stakeholders, and then of course the CSP preparations that really on the way. Here in the month of August, as I mentioned, we'll go ahead and finalize the, some of the CSP documents, and then uh, which we've already uh, been able to accomplish during the earlier part of this month. And as I mentioned, for to be Ben, I'm proud to say that did go live for that solicitation. So once again, major milestone in us being able to go out and get some bids from the general contractors. And then of course, uh, we are looking at uh, later this month to also have that CSP go live. Sure. Uh, for Del Valley. So that should occur here probably in the next uh, two to three weeks. Month of August, we're also expecting uh, to submit for the building permits. So once again, that is going to be a process, but so we are expecting in the month of August. And then just looking ahead into September, we are expecting the CSPs to close, make a final selection with some of the contractors, enter into contract negotiations, and of course, provide the board with an update in the month of September. And then just looking ahead, last point here, looking into the early fall, we are expecting to award the contract, and then we're also looking at the groundbreaking event. So once again, I just wanted to go ahead and reiterate that this was just a very high level uh, timeline, some of the upcoming milestones, and of course, just recognize all the team and all the efforts that everyone has been doing. So, um, And Stephanie, I think you wanted to touch base a little bit on Colony Park. Sure, and Mike, uh, please feel uh, free to chime in here. Um, we have been working actively with city staff. Um, our legal folks have been meeting uh, with us on a, every other week meeting to try to advance a purchase sale agreement for the property in Colony Park. We um, are on the September 2nd Austin City Council agenda for that transaction, and we are looking really forward to um, closing that deal. Uh, we've had a couple of changes, and I think um, we'll um, have to come back to you and uh, at a subsequent meeting. We're planning currently on the 25th as we learn more. Um, where we are at in those negotiations. And I think there will be a separate agreement around this partnership and some of the terms related to that They are that we are still trying to finalize the terms on. And hopefully we will have a lot more to report back on on August uh, the 25th of that, at that board meeting. Mike, did you want to add anything? Yes, thank you. Uh, members, uh, currently legal teams uh, from both Central Health as well as the city have been on couple of phone calls to start hammering out term sheets. I understand that you know we're needing to press a little harder on this to try to take it from term sheet to an actual legal document that uh, legal teams can actually look at and start redlining. So that's uh, a task that's for this week. Uh, we've been advised uh, here recently that this item has been pushed from the August council agenda. And again, I'm speaking about the land transaction uh, to sometime in September, but we're still going to keep working diligently um, and taking that additional time. And hopefully it won't be extended beyond that, but to make sure that, you know, legally we've got a good document to perfect the land transaction. There was a change and lastly in the appraisal value of an amount of $25,000. Uh, we're currently looking at that appraisal and talking to the city about whether or not it really makes a difference. Um, and so just so you know, those discussions are ongoing as well. Um, I don't see any of this as derailing. I think our biggest challenge and risk is the scheduling and the agenda um, of the council and getting this in front of the council. Uh, other than that, uh, that's uh, my co contribution to, to the update. I want to thank all the staff, um, Rachel and Margarito and Stephanie and, and many, many others that have just pitched in and really pushed this uh, to the point where we are out uh, with documents in the marketplace. So this is a great milestone time for us. Thank you.
So if you know any uh, contractors that would like to do business with Central Health, um, we have our Hornsby Bend project live and we are um, hoping for proposals there. And then we should have Del Valley separately later on uh, this month. And I just got a report hot off the press that 33,000 invitations were sent out through BidSync and the controller site yesterday. And then we have an additional 320 that we've done internally. So a lot of um, notice already given out there to the community. Thanks, we're happy to answer any questions. Okay, if you have any, if you have any questions, please raise your hand. And I'll recognize you, Manager Valadez. Yes, and Stephanie, you read my mind because uh, talking about the contractors and me talking about uh, uh, whether or not we, we could, uh, is there any way to, um, I guess, look at uh, hub participation in this project? Um, I know I, I, I know we can't uh, legally do that, but I want to make sure that that especially since we're doing projects in in neighborhoods that I know are our communities uh, that have uh, diverse residents and and I don't want to sit there and, and specify any uh, color, religion, language, but I do know that they're all, all in these particular neighborhoods. And is, is there anything that we can do? I'm just curious. I, Mike would like to answer this question. <laughs> yes, um, it's not just look at hubs, it's actively do what we can That's to right. compel as many bids submitted. So it's not just look, there's action right. we can take. I agree. Um, even, even in advance of, a, of the conclusion of the hub disparity study. And I know that um, Stephanie and Rachel and um, the procurement departments, as well as our community and outreach department have worked collaboratively to figure out, you know, what is it that we can do uh, to do more promotion amongst um, historically underutilized businesses. So there's a lot that we can act on and it, it goes beyond looking. So I, I think that's the good news. Um, and also just with construction being what it is these days, uh, this is a this is a tremendous job opportunity um, for for a lot of folks that you know Manager Valdez that you've noted uh, noted and so uh, we're mindful of that and, um, and as much as we can do it at the community level you know we'll we'll do what we can absolutely thank you all okay thank you, thank you. Um, I'm sorry Manager Jones uh, if I if I may Manager Jones yes go ahead um, and Manager Valdez to your point um, there is language in the solicitation that speaks to that and the vendors are required to submit and we'll, we'll follow the solicitation to the letter. That was all, Manager Jones, thank you. Okay. Thank you, uh, other, are there other questions? I have a few, but I wanted to give other board members opportunity before I ask. Not seeing any. Okay, I'll just ask my, I have a couple of questions. One is, uh, it's my understanding, um, that the city council delayed, I uh, mean, push this from uh, August to September. Is that correct, uh, uh, Ma uh, Ms. McDonald? Yes. It's correct. I think we are all trying to work on meeting that September deadline, making sure that we um, have an agreement that we can advance. Uh, I guess my question is not, obviously it's too late for that, but the question is, is there anything board members who are appointed by council uh, could do to encourage that. I'm not one of them, so I can't speak to that. But from council, is there something I can encourage our board members to do to contact their council members and say, hey, look, this is a priority. We understand COVID is obviously number one at this point in time, but we'd like to move this process along. Is there anything that can be done to do that? As a former yes, council aide, I have thoughts about this, but I will defer to those Gotta stay in my lane here, Mike. Um, feel free to uh, weave over into my lane, please, Stephanie. But I, I think, uh, Manager Jones, thank you. That's a great question. Um, thank you for volunteering the other board members to do that. Um, we may need that. Uh, not at this time, though. I feel like it's it's in a good place. But as I said, we have meetings uh, tomorrow, actually today, and then again this Friday, and at as this gets closer and closer to that critical time, if it looks like there's an issue, then absolutely we'll circle back around with the board members. And, and we, we thank you for putting that on the table. It helps when you all uh, weigh in from time to time. Okay. Uh, 
Any, any thoughts on that board members that might be city council member appointed? City council appointed? Not seeing any, uh, manager Valdez. You're on mute. I'm not a city council member appointed, but I can uh, contact the city council members and the mayor, whoever I know, to make sure that they step up on this because we need to get moving. The other people in those areas have been looking for a clinic for a long time or an updated, cl updated clinic like in Colony Park. Uh, and we need them to, to understand that this is an urgent situation, especially since we are in, as you said, we're still in the pandemic and Delta is increasing in the way it impacts our communities, especially those that live out there that have no, no set resources. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Manager Bell, did you have a comment? I did. Um, thank you, uh, Manager Jones or Chair Jones. I appreciate that. Um, I am appointed by council, uh, Austin City Council. Um, and I do believe that, you know, upon the cue of the organization, um, we have a organized way to present our thoughts to the council. Um, really and truly being from a, an agency where we dealt a lot with elected officials, uh, having us all go out there with different messages and different asks and um, not necessarily a clear script uh, could hurt us more than it can help us. So um, I think it's a great idea, uh, but I think the agency, I think central health itself needs to be ready as we go forward so that we go forward at the right time and that we go forward with a clear message of what we want to get across. Excellently said, I agree. Um, I guess what I'm just encouraging that Mike, as you feel the appropriate time, it may be helpful to garner those who are board, uh, who are appointed by this council to back you up in that discussion is basically what I, I heard uh, Manager Bell said. Yes, sir. I'll continue to confer with Stephanie and Celso and Fairland and others, and it feels like it gets to that point, we'll certainly do that. Thank you. I would be happy to support that effort, but ha having been in uh, one, not appointed, and secondly, still in in a conflict period, I can't really approach the city council for a period of time still. So, but I am supportive of the Euro's efforts, whatever you decide. But my second question uh, goes to sort of outreach. Um, I know you all have done an excellent job in informing us, keeping us involved of in what you're doing, letting us know what's going on in the Eastern Crescent in, the, in terms of these facilities and service delivery letting probably others, uh, community groups know. But I'm wondering in terms of letting the general public, are there general types of things you could be doing more of? Door hangers, door knockers, uh, flyers, uh, radio presentations, anything beyond what we're currently doing to let the regular John and Jane Doe uh, know what's going on in the community uh, that you could speak to and, and elaborate on. Again, I should probably stay in my lane and defer this over to Ted and his team. I would like to let you know that there are project websites that are updated regularly for these uh, Del Valley and Horsby Bend. There is an email list that um, goes out to many people and I can tell how many people that um, are subscribed to that list and receive those updates. Um, those are regular as well. I think Margarita uh, alluded to them. We did have an active survey. And I think we ported back on some of those findings at the May, at the last uh, May board meeting. Um, and I do um, also know that they've been doing a lot of social media and um, I even have seen uh, social media pushes for our uh, contractor solicitation. So thanks to Ted and his team. And Ted, I'm not sure if you have anything else you'd like to add there. No, I think you um, covered it. This is Ted Burton, Vice President of Communications. Uh, we also continue to host our advisory committee meetings and do one-on-one uh, -on -one outreach with uh, residents in those specific areas. And we do have uh, a plan as we move forward, uh, move ahead uh, for groundbreaking and other key, key uh, milestones to kind of ramp up communications. And that would include um, some paid media uh, about the, each specific location. 
So that is all in the plans for the future. If you're talking specifically about uh, outreach for these clinics. Yeah, I, I just use an example. I had the opportunity to go to both JD's over on Decker and HEB on Springdale. And I, I, I just was there with another group who were surveying on another matter. And I just asked them, were you aware of their plans for clinics in those areas? And no one seemed to know what I was talking about. And so the question is, if we could use some of these large venues where people are in and out, that we could put flyers or posters or whatever marketing strategy might work. Obviously, you're not going to get everybody, but maybe the person who doesn't have an internet, who doesn't have contact to the uh, uh, flyer, I mean, to um, uh, postings at the, uh, our locations, a person who may not have the, those resources to contact their community or associations and group, maybe they might be able to find out some more information just by grassroots flyer information as it gets closer to those groundbreaking days. I think it'd be helpful. I think you... You nailed it, Manager Jones. I think as we get closer, we can ramp up that on the ground grassroots. We are at JD Supermarkets and have been uh, for the month of July, Tuesdays and Thursday nights, but that's specifically for uh, supporting vaccine uh, pop-up events and vaccine outreach. So our, uh, our interaction with the community at those events is specifically about vaccines and getting folks vaccinated. The flyer at those events, you know, it might be helpful as you get closer because people have other things beyond just the vaccine that could be helpful to utilize those opportunities for as well if it's possible. Agreed. Thank you. Okay, those were the only two things I had to uh, go over. Any other discussion on item number two? Um, Manager Brinson, did I see your hand? Your hand. Okay. Anybody else have any comments on that? Any I was going to make a motion, <laughs> but you have to tell us when the next meeting is. Yeah, well, I'm about to get there. I just want to make sure I covered every all the ground. Uh, not having any other discussion, then uh, I'd like to confirm the next Eastern Crescent Subcommittee meeting date and time location. Managers, our next Eastern Crescent subcommittee meeting is tentatively scheduled for Wednesday, September 8th. So I think we moved that to October, did we not? Yes, sir. October the 13th at 1 p.m. Okay, October the 13th at 1 p.m. at the Central Administrative Office, 1115, 1111 Isaza Chavez, Austin, Texas, 78702, and or remotely by video conferences depending on the status of the governor's disaster declaration and stay at home order. At this time, I'm ready to accept a motion for adjournment. I move, uh, I move to adjourn. Second. Okay, motion to second. All in favor say, raise your hand. Aye. Aye. Any opposition? Not seeing any, we consider ourselves adjourned and we'll go into our next meeting, which is the strategic planning I turn it over to the chair, Dr. Charles Bell. Thank you, Shannon. I appreciate that. Uh, members, do you need a break? I, I know that we are going to have a, a fairly long presentation for one of our items. Um, and so if you'd like to take your break now or you want to postpone it. So I see some break now, break now. So why don't we do um, 10 minutes, all right? Yeah, I'll give you 10 minutes. So let's come back at, it's 1.33, so 1.43. Dr. Bell, before you, before you start back, I just wanted to point out that the Cracker Jack IT staff at Central Health has fixed Ring Central, and we are now recording. Uh, they fixed it about 15 minutes into the Eastern Crescent meeting. So, excellent. I just excellent. wanted to thank them. San Sandy Co. Simmons on the job as always. Appreciate that. Okay, I, my clock reads 11.43. Um, good afternoon, members and uh, members of the public who've joined us.
Today is August 4th at uh, August 4th, 2021, and it is uh, 1 43 p.m. As a quorum of the Strategic Planning Committee is in attendance via our video conference, I'd like to call to order the meeting of the Central Health Strategic Planning Committee. Uh, before I go to the first agenda item, since we have had so many uh, glitches with the IT issues here today, I just want to poll the audience and if there was anyone who had attempted to sign up uh, to speak who was not able to do so that would like to uh, provide us comments, if you would just let me know, um, I'll be more than happy to give you the floor for three minutes. Um, not hearing anyone. So um, again, just wanted to poll the audience because of our IT issues that we've had today, which I hear are in the process of being fixed and our uh, issues with regard to our video conference uh, platform have been repaired. So Dr. Uh, Bell? Yes, ma'am. I, I just want to say that I appreciate that, but I also uh, appreciate uh, Madam Chair uh, Greenberg extending to the audience an opportunity to receive written testimony uh, throughout the process up to August 23rd, if I'm not mistaken. Isn't that what you said, Sherry? I would, I'm, I'm not sure what you're referring to, Manager Valadez. Well, because uh, we had, I, we did have some IT problems, issues today. Right, right, right. yes. I, you know, I was just, I was hoping and thanking you for maybe, I hope I didn't misunderstand, but extending to the audience opportunities to always uh, communicate with us and let us know what their, their concerns are. Of course, are. oh, of course. And, and uh, with respect to people not being able to or, or just decided not to show up because they couldn't get through on the phone lines, they, I thought you had extended to them opportunities to continue to uh, provide testimony or communication with Central Health up until the time yes. to take action. Yeah, oh, yes, Manager Valdez, I'm sorry. The it was and that's what away. I was and that's yes. what I was thanking you for. Yes, you are you are certainly correct, and I'm sorry the video sound the sound was cutting it out. We always welcome uh, <laughs> members of the public and the community to um, provide uh, feedback to us. And yes, we will continue to have many opportunities. Um, throughout our uh, meetings and our, our um, special meetings and budget meetings for public communication. And we welcome everyone to please either um, by video or if you call in, um, you know, to participate in public communication. Absolutely. Thank you, Manager Valadez. Thank you, Chair Greenberg. Thank you, Manager Valadez. I'd like to uh, bring up agenda item number one, which is review and approve the minutes of the June 9th, 2021 meeting of the Strategic Planning Committee. I have a motion by uh, Manager Valadez. Do I have a second? I have a second by Chair Greenberg. Any discussion? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Any abstaining? Motion carries. Agenda item number two, receive an update on healthcare system components and service planning methodology, including geographic considerations, demographic considerations, and public community and patient feedback with respect uh, to planning for certain types of services, such as urgent care. Dr. Alan Schalza, uh, Jonathan Morgan, and Monica Crowley will be presenting, and I think Monica is going to kick it off. Thank you, Dr. Bell. Monica Crowley, Central Health Chief Strategy and Planning Officer. Um, today, we are providing a short verbal update in response to a board question regarding urgent care search service delivery planning from uh, the June Strategic Planning Committee meeting. Uh, the more, a more fulsome presentation will be provided um, in the September Strategic Planning uh, Committee meeting, planning for urgent care and other types of services 
and what type of care is provided in different types of facilities is part of the equity focused system of care planning work that we will be kicking off next month in the September strategic planning committee meeting. Um, that work includes a safety net community needs assessment and a geographical needs assessment as part of developing service delivery goals and priorities and this deeper dive into urgent care and facilities planning will be part of this more fulsome kickoff presentation. But as we have described um, during this process uh, in past presentations, our work to immediately address currently identified gaps has not paused as we are entering into this more comprehensive planning process and Dr. Alan Shalsha and John Morgan will describe our ongoing efforts to uh, expand access, in, including urgent care. Thank you, Monica. Good afternoon, Board of Managers. Um, good care means uh, not only quality care, but timely care. Um, if I'd like to briefly define the difference between emergent and urgent care. Um, for emergent care, we're thinking about initiatives or uh, patients with chief complaints such as um, cardiac, um, cardiac needs or issues, um, acute respiratory distress, overt um, fractures. None of our clinics or our partners are set up um, to care for those types of initiatives. And so patients who experience you know, those chief complaints, we really still recommend you know, that they follow up in the ED. For urgent care needs, such as rashes, coughs, colds, you know, uh, bladder infections, um, we are working with our partners um, to try to increase same-day access, which we're considering urgent care. At the same time, as Monica and Mike had alluded to, you know, we're, we're continuing to, to conduct our systems-based approach um, in order to really kind of wrap this uh, more comprehensively. Um, but if we think about the opportunities that our patients have within our clinic system, um, if we can, and as we continue to increase their same day access, we have a plethora of clinics throughout Travis County. As we increase the opportunities for same day access in the clinics where patients consider that they have their medical home, we not only address the acute need, we also um, increase um, the follow-up or the chance for the follow-up for patients to have with their primary care teams. Um, and that ultimately will improve you know, the, the morbidity um, of our patients because those care teams know, you know, know, the, know, their, team, know their patients. Um, so again, we are actively working on that with our partners. Um, and as we continue to expand clinics, um, that same day access becomes immediately um, apparent or available. Um, the other advantage is we, we have the opportunity to put personnel in place and we don't actually have to put up a structure, which again, facilitates the movement of creating that, that access. So that work is ongoing now at the same time that the systems planning is happening with the team. And again, we'll get back to um, the, the board of managers, um, I think in about a month with more information. I'll turn it over to John. Thank you, Alan. Um, Good afternoon, managers. I'll just add a couple of quick points. Uh, one for the, the board's awareness. Uh, we, we did lose two of our four urgent and convenient care providers over about the past 18 months. Um, so we, we don't have quite as robust of a network for urgent care as we've had um, in the past. So as Alan mentioned, we are still looking at opportunities to partner in that space and, and always looking for opportunities to expand access. Um, in the urgent care space. But just to reiterate a couple of the points, you know, urgent care is um, really a stopgap solution for us or a temporary solution uh, with a fairly limited scope of services. And I say it's a stopgap because our, our goal is exactly what, what Alan described, that we're, we're building capacity in our primary care homes. Uh, we're creating that, that same day access and that after hours access for, um, for our patients throughout the community. Um, so happy to answer any questions. We'll be bringing a lot more detail in our systems planning exercise that looks at the, the geographic and demographic uh, distribution and access to these services um, and how we might uh, close some of those gaps in care. Uh, we'll also be looking at 
um, at different types of facilities and the requirements and considerations that go into those facilities, whether it's population density, um, whether it's time distance standards, uh, whether it's you know, timely access to care, as Alan mentioned, and the time to an appointment or the availability of walk-in access. So uh, looking forward to having those additional conversations with the board in the upcoming months. Thank you, John. All right, um, I'd like to open it up for any questions or comments by the board members, please. Um, let me see hands, um, Manager Jones and then Manager Valadez. Ladies first. <laughs> he has yielded the time to you, uh, well, Manager Valadez. So you and go mine's gonna be you. very quick. Um, I just remember uh, one of the, uh, ri um, Richard uh, Franklin, when he was talking in terms of having to uh, transport his wife in the middle of the night, who was suffering with a major, major migraine headache, she suffers from them, et cetera, et cetera, or it's something else, I don't know what it was, but it's something along those lines and not having a place uh, to go to out in the Eastern Crest in, in Hornsby Bend. And he being a black man, his wife being Anglo, and, and then hauling down the highway, you know, to get to the hospital, uh, he said, what would have happened if someone would have pulled me over? What do you think they might have thought? And that does strike me uh, as, um, as, as being, and not all, it could have, it could have been, it could have turned into a much more uh, complicated situation uh, for something that might've been easily taken care of uh, if there was something closer. But what I'm hoping is that our clinics are, you know, our, our patient and community uh, medical needs best uh, uh, needs assessment is going to help us with that, and I trust your team, Dr. Shalshan and and everybody else, to uh, come up with the appropriate uh, services in especially the outlying areas like uh, Hornsby Bend and uh, and the one on 812. Uh, I, I'm I'm truly truly concerned about their not having access to things at night, access to services at night. And, and especially no uh, pharmacy, but I, I did see that included in the previous uh, meetings, um, uh, breakdown of, of uh, project uh, items that were provided to us. And I just wanna make sure that, I don't know what that's considered. I don't know if it's emergent care, urgent care, you know, uh, just plain old uh, care. Uh, but I wanna make sure that, that at least between Hornsby Bend and Dell Valley, there is one place where people can go to receive and access those services. Uh, that truly bothers me because those are minority communities and marginalized communities and communities with no infrastructure. Thank you, Manager Valadez. Manager Jones? Uh, I can't echo what Manager Valadez said more so. I think she did an excellent job of presenting the scenario. I personally had an experience very similar to uh, of what she alluded to, uh, having lived in Hornsby Bend myself, and it was at eight o'clock at night. And even though I probably qualified, I probably did not qualify to go to a urgent care facility that we would operate, there was no urgent care facility at all. And so I had to literally drive myself with a broken shoulder almost into town. And I imagine if you replicate all these scenarios multiple times, with the growth that has occurred in this area, there just seems to be no reason that in 2021, we find ourselves with nothing in terms of urgent care for anyone for the most part, other than a location I understand out here in Maynard. So I just encourage that as we come up with our strategy for our population, that we look at the de demographics, but also the geography of where we're looking at as enhancement to what we're doing and not replacement for what we're doing. Because even though you're open from eight to eight, urgent care hopefully will consider the possibility that it could be longer than that or work on something to be able to provide. So well, these are working class communities, people who are injured, who don't have time between eight and five for the most part to be able to see about healthcare. The last thing is Dr. Uh, Shawshaw, could you help, how can we help the public to understand what you said about urgent versus emergent, because to many, many individuals, it's not an emergency situation is 
basically I'm bleeding laying on the ground. Mm -hmm. Urgent may be someone who say, I have a severe headache or I can't function right now, but there's no place for me to go other than the emergency room. So is there anything we can do more to help our, our populations to understand the difference from our perspective and we understand their perspective as well? Um, it's, a, it's a great question. And I think the, the example um, that Manager Valadez gave is, is kind of a, a perfect example of something that lives in the gray area and very hard to define because a migraine or a headache can be caused by different things and you know, may be okay in an urgent care, but you know, maybe if it's caused due to a bleed, obviously an ER is, is, is a better place for that. So I think what we can do is we can take the broad categories such as concern for an overt fracture, such as respiratory distress. We can take the things that are overt and start educating you know, our communities on that. And I think the areas where there is gray, um, I think patients are gonna go you know, to wherever they think, and we probably need to stay away from those areas. Um, but I think there are some big categories that we can provide education on. Thank you. Uh, Jonathan, before you, Add on. I'd like to ask uh, a sort of a an add-on question to Dr. Shalsha. Um, do we have a? Um, I, I know at times I've heard them called nurse lines, uh, someplace that uh, a patient can call, talk to a healthcare professional about their uh, symptoms and signs and get a better idea of um, the type of um, service that might be needed or appropriate for them um, at that point in time. Many times it's a triage and you're able to, you know, let them know that, you know, I, I understand you're in pain, but you might want to try these things prior to going to the emergency room or seeking out an urgent care. Um, I know those lines exist, and I don't know if we have, have any of those resources available to our clients. And that could either be Dr. Shalsha or, or uh, Jonathan. I, I, I can take that. Um, great, great question again. Um, yes, sir, we do have those um, triage lines available after hours. Um, and it really is the coverage completely you know, from the end of the workday to the beginning of the workday. It really is a nurse triage. Um, and they can page the, the physician on call as needed. Um, but those are for active patients and people who are not in the system don't really have access to those lines. Okay, so those are for only like community care patients that are really designated as community care patients, correct? Correct, sir. Got it. Jonathan? Dr. Bell, just to add to that. So we, we also have a, a nurse triage line that is specific to the MAP coverage program. So in addition to what's available at community care or maybe available at other primary care homes, we do have a, a nurse triage line and that phone number is on the, the back of every, every MAP card. Uh, so that, that service is available in addition to what uh, Dr. Shaw should described at community care. Um, I would highlight that, you know, as we've talked about the, the EPIC implementation at community care uh, over the course of this year, you know, it's really been about swapping out our old EHR with the new EHR, but with that comes a lot of additional opportunity and functionalities for us to continue building on virtual care solutions. So that could be a centralized care team that's available, kind of like Dr. Shalsha um, just described, uh, or it could be additional virtual care solutions like a virtual convenient care practice that today just does not exist for our patients. Um, the other thing, I just back to Alan's last um, uh, comment. Uh, one of the things that you'll hear about in our next presentation uh, for our six clinical focus areas is our proposed focus area on care team and patient clinical education. Um, to to uh, Manager Jones's point, uh, there's a lot that we can do um, in terms of additional education for our patients. Over the past year, most if not all of that uh, outward facing outreach and education has been pandemic focused, uh, but as we uh, hopefully get that situation under control here locally, we can start to pivot some of that messaging and we have plans and a proposal 
to actually create an education function, a clinical education function here at Central Health so that we can continue to promote those types of efforts. That's excellent, John. I see you, Manager Valadez. Let me, I'd like to make one more comment. Um, in addition to uh, what Dr. Shalsha and, and John, which you've outlined to um, Manager Jones with regard to education, I think that's important, but we might want to add uh, an educational component about that phone number that's on the back of their map card, because I think I probably have a phone number on the back of my insurance card that I don't know anything about, uh, but uh, reminding individuals that that's there and available to them um, at a time when uh, they might need it uh, could be quite helpful for them in the future. Manager Valadez, you have a comment and you're on mute, so. Just a, just a quick uh, addition or reminder, you know, our patients are also the uninsured. Uh, and so just because they're not MAP patients or MAP basic patients, our patients are the uninsured. So I want to make sure that we understand just that nobody's, hopefully no one is turning in, not on MAP or MAP basic away. I don't think so. Um, but I, especially in these outlying areas uh, that don't have access to very many resources, uh, those are our patients. And so when we think about our patients, it's everybody that's not privately insured, in my opinion. A am I correct in that or not? Um, I, I think you are correct. Um, I do believe though that, you know, those are individuals that we would like to serve. But until we have information on those individuals to bring them into a system, it's very difficult to communicate with them. And so we try very hard to outreach to those individuals that are uninsured, that meet our population uh, requirements, our, our criteria. But um, it would be hard to set up a, a, a nurse triage line for the uninsured, uh, just because of the fact that you don't quite know exactly who those are. And they could be different people at different times. No. So I might be uninsured now because I don't have a job, but I could get a job and be insured. So um, I, I understand what you're saying, Manager Valadez. I just think that um, it's not as easy as you seem to outline it to sort of take this population and actually make it a medical population that we can actually address in a way that we can increase uh, their health or improve their health outcomes. We try, all right, but I don't necessarily know that it's that easy. Mike Diesel, I think you had something to say or a comment? Uh, it was in response to Manager Valdez's question. Um, so Dr. Bell, you actually covered it, but just to put a little bit finer point to the, to the threshold, it's at 200% federal poverty level and, and below and those that are uninsured. I mean, that's that's where our focus is, but I, I think you, you covered the other points. So no further comments. Thank you, sir. Quite welcome. Manager Ballad is a follow-up. Just, just a follow-up. Um, you know, I live in that world and I almost every family that I deal with, that I talk to um, is someone, it, oh, I, I, it's someone that I always recommend and call MAP, call MAP, call Central Health, uh, get on MAP, get on MAP, get on MAP. And, um, and I, I, so I, I'm a big advocate for pushing MAP everywhere because I have lots of faith in our, in our uh, enterprise. Uh, but I do feel that there are some things that we can do uh, like the billboards. I love the billboard that says, uh, you know, working poor, out of work, call this number, you know, something like that. Uh, because you're, even if you're out of work, like Dr. Bell, I would have said it in the alternative, the way you said it, you said until you get a job, you know, maybe you can access or access us uh, or access real insurance, I guess, after something, whatever you said. But I would have said that there are patients, even after they get a job, because they can choose to uh, receive their services at community care. I think that was my my uh, uh, understanding of how that works and why, why it's such a good uh, 
complementary system, you know, to yeah, not having access to services and then having access to services. And even if we're on a private system, we can still choose to have our doctors to make them the community care doctors. And, and so I think that's a, I would love for everybody to be at community care. You know, uh, we can't do that, but I think it would solve a lot of issues. Uh, and I, I, as Dr. Jones, I mean, Manager Jones has said, and other people from the previous meetings, you know, this a universal messaging system has got to be put out there, especially for issues that are so important and so predominant in our communities. High blood pressure, diabetes, you know, blah, 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 pandemic, testing, vaccine, blah, blah, blah. That's, one sheeter and and I'm with whoever said put that in the form of a, a little poster and I promise you every business in town will allow you to put that in the front of their of their door as people are walking in put it on the door or to the side everybody looks at those signs you know if, you, I, if they don't I think they're lying <laughs> thank you I agree with you thank you very much I think that uh, FQHCs play an extremely important and flexible role in our healthcare system. Uh, they do allow for individuals going in and out of work to continue to have a um, continuum of care. Um, and that is important with uh, the same provider. So uh, I think that's one of the reasons why a decision was made before I was on the board to establish community care as an FQHC that is affiliated with the city or central health and I guess back then the city. Um, and so it, it does play a very important role. Thank you. Thank Any you. other questions or comments? Um, if not, I will call up agenda item number three receive and discuss updates on the proposed fiscal year FY 2022 strategic priorities, including systems planning for immediate service delivery focus area, uh, part two, uh, A, substance use disorder and behavioral health, and B, clinic and patient education and transitions of care. Dr. Alan Shalsha, uh, Dr. John Weems, Dr. John Swanson, Jonathan Morgan, Dakasha Leonard, Cynthia Gallegos, and Monica Crowley will be presenting. And I will turn it over to Monica to kick this off and get the right presenters in line. And um, we, here we go. Thank you so much, Dr. Bell. And um, I, I'm going to hand it off to Dr. Shalsha in a second to, to do proper introductions of our presenters. Um, but I do want to um, thank everyone on the team um, who has worked on putting together these proposed um, priority immediate service delivery uh, initiatives and um, for the clinicians who are um, here presenting today. Um, the, this is uh, part two in the deep dive presentations on the immediate service delivery focus area uh, proposed fiscal year 22 um, strategic budget priorities. Next slide, please. Um, hello again, and I'm incredibly excited uh, to introduce three individuals actually to the, to the board of managers. And, um, and then I'll, I'll touch on this slide um, presenting today, we, we have Josh Adivera. Josh is a practice administrator who has presented to you all before. Um, he works with um, really complex um, communities and patients within community care and has really been um, a patient advocate and, um, and, and really is responsible for a lot of the complexities that we've worked through for uh, some of the initiatives that, um, that you're about to see. Um, I also would like to introduce um, Dr. John Weems. Um, John comes to us from um, Boston, Massachusetts, where he did um, the majority of his training. He finished up at Harvard with uh, a fellowship in addiction medicine. Um, he's been with community care for about a year. Um, basically, uh, community care reached out to him on a daily basis when he was getting close to finishing his, uh, his training based on his uh, enthusiasm for the, this patient population um, and obviously his expertise. 
Um, so Josh and John will, will present first. I also wanted to introduce Dr. Nick Yagoda. And Nick, if you could, could wave or say hi. Um, Dr. Yagoda is the new um, CMO for Community Care. He's been with Community Care for about seven years and really has been central instrumental for so many of the successes that Community Care has had uh, prior to the pandemic and during the pandemic. Community Care is incredibly fortunate to have Nick and the enterprise is incredibly fortunate to have Nick um, at the helm. Um, I wanted to introduce him as there may be questions that are more appropriate for Nick to answer if they're CUC specific. Um, and with that, I'll touch on this slide. Um, this is the Cogwell slide um, that really um, shows components of a high functioning system. We will touch on some of the individual cogs and we will also spend time on what we consider kind of the oil um, that enables these cogs to move fluidly, fluidly um, and patients to transition throughout the system um, with greater ease. We'll talk about transitions of care and we'll talk about clinical education, which I think we've already touched on the critical importance of that. Next slide, please. Uh, just as I said before, this is the um, deep dive number two into the immediate service delivery focus areas. You've already had presentations in June on specialty care access and health care for the homeless. Um, and this is completing our uh, deep dives into the proposed strategic priority areas, and we will be um, preparing a budget resolution, a proposed budget resolution document for your um, priority areas for fiscal year 22, um, it, based upon these proposed priorities. Next slide. Managers, I have one last slide here before we turn it over to the main event. Um, this is another slide that you've you've seen before, um, but thought that it was it was helpful to refresh. Um, this slide is intended to summarize our initial prioritization factors that were considered by our staff and our clinical and operational subject matter experts in different areas um, into, into identifying the six focus areas that Monica just showed you, as well as the initial um, or immediate initiatives that, that we've proposed to include in the FY22 um, healthcare delivery budget. Um, our team considered things such as the impact of an initiative uh, or a service area on morbidity, morbidity and mortality. Um, we looked at opportunities to impact multiple conditions or service lines through a single initiative, which you'll hear about some today. Um, our entire systems planning process is looking at disparities in our population and opportunities to close those gaps. Um, and we also consulted with our internal clinical and operations subject matter experts, as well as our clinical partners who work in these service areas every day. Um, and again, you'll hear from a few of those individuals here momentarily. Um, and importantly, uh, we, we weave in patient and community feedback throughout our process, as you all are aware. Um, on the front end, we, we looked at patient surveys and feedback. Uh, we also, um, through the community outreach team, as you all know, we seek input and feedback on our proposed budget uh, throughout that entire process uh, over the course of each year. Um, so I will turn it over to Dr. Weems, who is going to uh, launch into our the, the first part of our presentation uh, on, on substance use. Fantastic. And um, John, could you give me a thumbs up if you can hear me? Sure can. You're good to go, sir. Great. I'm on a um, wired connection here, but if there's been some fuzziness, so if, if it's if I'm breaking up, can somebody hop in and just let me know? We have a, a back. We sure will. Thanks. Thanks, y'all. Um, so thanks for the kind introduction. Uh, my name is John Williams. I'm an internal medicine doctor here at Community Care and an uh, addiction medicine specialist. Um, when I started medical school, I, it wasn't with an interest in substance use disorder or addiction. I, um, I knew that my calling was towards the margins and vulnerable populations, but it wasn't really till I was on the ward seeing patients that um, it became very clear that people with addiction problems were presenting with complications of their addiction and the health system was just, and didn't, it was not yet equipped to deal with the underlying disease of addiction. And that really transformed my experience in medical education. There was amazing patients and fantastic um, recovery coaches of people in recovery who um, taught me a lot. And I was very fortunate to have mentors who 
showed how wonderful the clinical care was, but also how important it is to think about systems to better serve this really vulnerable um, population. Um, so Josh and I are both really grateful to be talking to uh, this group and to be thinking together about how we can think about some system transformation uh, for our MAP population in particular here in Austin, Travis County. Um, next slide, please. So the agenda today is that we'll start up by talking about addiction as a chronic disease, a, a bit about the landscape of uh, addiction treatment here in Travis County, and then identify some gaps in care, which um, uh, include navigation, education, and opportunities for better medication access for our patients. Next slide, please. So um, I think we should start with the definition. So we define addiction as a primary chronic brain disease characterized by compulsive drug use despite harmful consequences. And there's a couple pieces here to take apart. Addiction is a primary disease. So it's not a manifestation of other psychiatric illnesses like depression or anxiety. It's its own process that has its own evaluation and its own uh, set of treatments, which have been shown to be effective. And we're gonna talk more about uh, the science of uh, brain disease and addiction. Um, and the last piece that I really wanna stop and focus on is that the, the disease itself is used despite harmful consequences. And I think when I'm talking to patients and their families, uh, I think this is the key piece to keep front of mind, that this is an illness that affects the brain and the ability to make decisions and uh, control over people's lives. And um, that's an important concept to, to uh, hold on to. There are cycles of relapse and remission, which we'll talk about. A question that also comes, often comes up is, why do some people develop addiction and others don't? Which I think is a really relevant and good one. And um, what most patients don't realize, and a lot of folks don't, is that this is a genetic disease. So the genetic contribution to substance use disorders is 40 to 60%. Um, and the other risk factors include things that my colleague, Dr. Swanson, is going to speak on a little bit later, include adverse childhood experiences, toxic environments that a lot of our um, uh, communities are facing, and co-occurring psychiatric illnesses. And then there's the exposure. So there needs to be the drug exposure to develop a drug problem, but I think often our focus is on the drug and the potential addictive qualities of the drug rather than the person who develops uh, the illness. And I should say, when I'm talking about drugs, I include tobacco and alcohol within this, as well as illegal drugs um, that patients develop problems with. And without treatment, addiction can be progressive and result in disability or premature. Next slide. So um, addiction is a treatable disease. So this morning I was seeing patients, many with uncontrolled uh, hypertension. So that graph on the left really shows that when folks have um, pre-treated disease, their severity is high. And then during treatment, it comes down to their, we use treatments that work. And then when they fall out of treatment, um, their symptoms worsen. The exact same thing is true of addiction treatments. Um, but the difference is that we really have a model in this country for at least the last hundred years, where instead of throwing resources at people and showing compassion and bringing them more care when they're struggling, which often means drug use, um, we push them out of care and we try to stack on the harms and consequences of drug use through approaches like um, incarceration and, and other approaches that, that frankly don't work. Instead, we need to think about addiction as a chronic disease that we would treat like any other uh, chronic disease. And why is this difference? I, I think stigma. And that's one of the, our focus areas is education because the stigma around addiction is one of the biggest barriers to successful treatment for our patients. Next slide. Um, so the science is, is pretty clear on this one. So the addiction changes brain structures and function, and it's similar to other end organ problems that we see in the clinic all the time. So if you look on the left, you have two images of a heart. The one on the left shows a lot of healthy metabolic tissue that you see that ring of red and orange. And then after somebody suffered a heart attack or other heart issues, there's less of that healthy tissue. If you look over to your right, that same model applies to the brain of somebody who's suffering with an addiction problem. So the healthy control there has those nice yellow orange highlighted areas in the part of the brain that really makes decision, weighs risks and benefits in exercises behavioral control. And somebody who's suffering with a cocaine use disorder doesn't have that part of the brain as active. And so we can use functional imaging like this to better understand that this is truly a brain disease, um, similar to the way we understand other kinds of disease like heart disease. Next slide, please. And the good news is this gets better. I mean, one of the unfortunately kept secrets of addiction medicine is people recover and they get much, much better. And so from left to right, what you'll see is the brain of a healthy person, somebody who's um, 
been without using meth for a month and then somebody 14 months in, and you'll see the first and third pictures resemble each other. And that's because brains heal and people get much, much better from this illness. It makes the work really fulfilling. Um, and I think it also informs our approach to models of care. Um, you know, the kind of the traditional approach of 30 day treatment of one time interventions, we know that people don't heal that quickly. And instead, we need a chronic care, a continuum of care and a chronic disease model to treat addiction. Next slide. So I, I hope it's signaling that this is a brain disease that has effective treatments, and which makes this next slide um, uh, all the more urgent and disappointing, which is that the overdose crisis is worsening uh, across this country and especially here in Texas. So even before COVID started, um, addiction and the overdose crisis, in particular opioid overdoses, had lowered the life expectancy for Americans under the age of 50 years for the first time in decades and was the leading cause of premature um, mortality in the US. This has gotten worse with COVID, unfortunately, and 100,000 people probably died in the last 12 months of an overdose in the US. So Texas uh, in the past has been not spared, but has not had the rate of rise of overdose deaths that we've seen in other parts of the country. And unfortunately, that, that trend doesn't hold anymore. And what you'll see, the arrows on the bottom right show that the percent change uh, in overdose deaths in the U.S. has been staggering. And unfortunately, it's even worse here in Texas. And we see the effect of that, unfortunately, here in, in Travis County and the patients we serve. Um, this, this is the most immediate consequence of addiction. But what this doesn't capture is the social harms. I mean, the people who are suffering in isolation from a treatable disease, the communities that they're not a part of, and then all the other medical issues. So cirrhosis and other liver problems, cancers that come from alcohol, uh, and then uh, HIV, hepatitis C, and other infectious diseases that result from injection drug use form a, a, a huge burden of illness that um, our population faces. Uh, next slide, please. So crisis like the overdose crisis worsen disparity. So there's um, this sort of sentiment out there that addiction doesn't recognize categories, that anybody is vulnerable. And that's true. I mean, it's, there's fairly steady levels of addiction across populations. Um, but I think what that doesn't really get at is that access, quality, and outcomes are different for different populations. And people who are already uh, belong to vulnerable populations are more vulnerable when they acquire an addictive disorder. And so what this data shows is that the growth in overdose deaths over four years grew much more rapidly in the black population and Latinx populations relative to the white population. This is often missed because largely our media narratives center around um, white lives and how they've been affected by substance use disorder in particular. And the data tell another story and we see this as well within our population. Uh, next slide, please. So um, what is effective Treatment. The good news is, is that the models of care that work for other chronic illnesses work for addiction as well. And so the, um, it's a combination of medications, psychosocial interventions, and recovery supports. I'll say that methadone and buprenorphine for the treatment of opioid use disorder are some of the most effective medicines we have in medicine, period. So as an internist, I wish in other areas in cardiology and oncology, we had medicines that worked as well as these do. They reduce mortality by 50%, and that's been consistent across numerous studies. For other addictive disorders, there's medications that work and um, access to these medications is a critical um, uh, part of improving our system. Psychosocial interventions largely center around building skills and enhancing motivation to engage in treatment. And then I think when most folks think about treatment for addiction, we think about Alcoholics Anonymous and Al-Anon, and that definitely has a role and helps a lot of people under that category of mutual help organizations. Um, and I think I would add to that in terms of recovery supports, recovery coaching, which we'll talk more about um, later in the presentation. Next slide. Please. So um, what we have here is kind of like that presenting image of what recovery is, our expectations, this kind of linear stepwise improvement versus the reality. And I, when I look at this, it's just really striking. There's no one pathway to recovery. And so um, models like what you'll see on the left, which comes from um, my own professional organization, the American Society of Addiction Medicine, this sort of level of care of decreasing intensity over time. And it kind of paints the story of, you know, folks initially present with high acuity and then they gradually improve in this very uh, linear fashion. That doesn't really hold, especially for our population, the social vulnerabilities they face. Um, and so what does this mean? It means that 
we need low barrier access to treatment across all nodes in the system and that we need accompaniment and navigation for our patients as they're on their own path to recovery. Next slide. So this is my attempt almost a year into sort of lay out some aspects of the substance use disorder treatment system here in Austin, Travis County. And you'll recognize some sort of tr traditional sites of care along the bottom with acute care hospitals, e the ED and EMS and our partners with the community health paramedics in the city of Austin who are uh, great partners. And then I'll point out to the Del Seton Medical School B team is a big partner for our MAT clinic. Josh will tell you more about that. In the uh, lower left-hand corner, so like at seven o'clock, we have um, uh, primary care-based treatment, which we're a part of here, outpatient specialty treatment, and then methadone clinics uh, by federal regulation are separate than other healthcare uh, agencies, um, but a, a key life-saving treatment. Similarly, in community resources and harm reduction agencies um, are critical in thinking about a system of treatment because they keep people alive who are using drugs and living dignified lives. The sort of traditional residential treatment and psychiatric services fall under the umbrella of our partners at Invocal Care, um, continuing to move over to the right because our policy approach to um, addiction in this country is prohibition. The correctional systems are critical nodes in the treatment system. And then especially for our folks, shelter is key. For medically complicated people, that often means skilled nursing facilities on a temporary basis uh, to address medical um, issues, but then also many other settings, including our partners at the Sobering Center. So next slide, please. So um, what this slide I hope can do is I'll walk you through sort of the um, early stages of addiction medicine systems with the graphic going clockwise, and then to map onto that some really key insights that we're getting from the data and analytics team um, at Central Health to really start to understand what the unique burden of illness is from addiction for our MAP population. So what you'll see at the top at 12 o'clock is people presenting with high acuity. There's a lack of effective treatment and poor coordination and a real significant burden of unmet social needs, which leads to limited success and representations with a high acuity, so a, 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 a vicious cycle. Um, what we've noted amongst MAP patients is that uh, indeed people are presenting with high acuity and people with substance use disorder who present to acute care have longer length of hospital stays relative to um, the rest of the population. And during COVID, when there is a reduced uh, rate of presentation to emergency settings, the emergency room and inpatient settings, for the general population, it went up for people with substance use disorder. So this illness got worse during COVID and that shows in the, this early data that we have. Moving clockwise again, so uh, the lack of effective treatment, what this data shows so far is amongst our population, people presenting to acute care settings, the most prevalent drug problem is for alcohol and there's no formal uh, alcohol treatment accessible to MAP patients at this time. And then finally, in terms of significant unmet social needs, 56% of people presenting to acute care with a drug problem are also experiencing homelessness. And I think that really highlights just how vulnerable a population this is and that approach, or any approach we take needs to take into account the social determinants of health. Next slide, please. So I'm gonna tell two patient stories that I hope highlight um, some of the um, aspects of the system and areas where we could uh, improve things. So the first story is one of a patient, Justin, who I met back in January. Um, in December, unfortunately, his sister uh, was in the ICU with COVID and pneumonia, and uh, she was his most important support in life, and his life started to unravel around that time. So he was brought in by EMS to the ER three times for opioid overdoses. And after that third time, he was connected with the methadone clinic, which remember is a life-saving medicine, uh, important, but separate from the healthcare system. And so when he presented to the, um, our buprenorphine clinic, the MAT clinic at Southeast Health and Wellness in January, we had to sort out what had been going on before. And luckily we were able to get him on buprenorphine again, another life-saving medication. And since then we've seen him 17 times, probably now more than 20 times um, this year. He's had a rocky course. So despite being on the medicine, uh, he fell out of the clinic and then had an overdose in March and had a prolonged ICU stay after which he has many medical problems that complicated his course even further. And so in kind of preparing for this, we look back at the record, he's touched emergency services 25 times since that overdose. And that's MCOT, psych emergency services, emergency transitional housing. And something that Justin is up against is he has these medical issues and he's in settings of care to try to stabilize him. And there's 
he has medical concerns, so he gets sent to the emergency department. The emergency department says, this doesn't need to be admitted. You need to be stabilized in another place. And the lack of coordination amongst those different entities has led to just like discontinuities in his care over and over again. So a lot of the work we were doing was trying to uh, link up with emergency services and just uh, work with harm reduction agencies to try to keep him alive to get to the end of this. Um, and fortunately, most recently, he is in uh, residential treatment right now and is relatively stable. So what lessons can we take away from this? This is a person presenting over and over again with high acuity presentation. So really fitting that, that cycle so well. In retrospect, when his sister was in the ICU, he lost a place to stay. So not having a place to stay was, was a significant determinant of his outcomes. This is a patient with very high resource utilization um, and poor outcomes, which... Oops. Can folks hear me? Yeah, yeah, I can hear you. Gotcha. Um, thanks. And poor outcomes that thankfully haven't been fatal. And I think the final point from Justin's story to take away is nobody with a drug problem would ever design a system like this. Like mm -hmm. his, for somebody who's in active use or in recovery, their, their insights are critical when we're thinking about building better systems of care. We need to hear the community voice and we need to really center the voices of, of people in recovery in our efforts. Next slide. The next story is of a patient called Juan who is from the Eastern Crescent. And the beginning of his life was, of his adult life, was in and out of incarcerated settings, homeless and using uh, injection, uh, injection drug use with heroin. Um, he presented to the Del Seton Medical Center in March of 2020 in the ICU with sepsis, congestive heart failure. So multiple organs shutting down on death's door, doing really poorly. Thankfully, he was stabilized on the medicine by our colleagues on the buprenorphine team in the clinic and then was discharged to our care. Um, before I was there, thankfully, Josh and Dr. Goto were there and um, got him, continued him on the medicine. He had an infection for which he needed IV antibiotics. So he was in post-acute care for six weeks, during which time he connected with a central health intensive case manager who really walked with him through the rest of his journey, really navigating along the way. And that's what's represented by the, the person lifting the other one up is that um, that navigation and accompaniment were critical, in my opinion, to, his, to this patient's success. After the IV antibiotics, he was admitted to residential treatment in June of last year, and he left the first day because it reminded him of being incarcerated. His case manager worked with him to talk with his family about what his prospects were, as somebody who has an addiction problem, who's in treatment, who's doing well. And I'm happy to say that he's been at home for more than a year now, reunited with his family. I think one of the critical interventions there was education around stigma. I mean, she really stuck with him and helped him and his family understand what his life would look like. In the meantime, we've cured his hep C, optimized his congestive heart failure. And frankly, he's kind of a, that's not right. He's, it's like a very straightforward visit to see him. He's no longer a medically complicated patient. He's, he's thriving out in the community. Uh, next slide, please. So as we move from Justin and Juan to think more about the system of care, I encourage us to use this model of the cascade of care, which is borrowed from the HIV world where from left to right, we have um, opportunities to capture patients, to uh, engage them in treatment. And the, the, you'll see there's efforts of primary prevention for the general population. We're all at risk for developing an addictive disorder, secondary prevention for those at higher risk. And then the treatment gap here is represented by that red area of the bar. These are folks who have a disorder that aren't in treatment yet. And this is how we measure success, how we close down that treatment gap and retain people in care. Why does this matter for this illness? For opioid use disorder in particular, the medicines work so well that if you can retain somebody in treatment, you're keeping them alive. And so um, that's how we think about success in our program. And that's how I encourage us to think about it system wide. Next uh, slide, please. This exact model was applied in a recent national publication by our um, colleagues on the B team who described the experience with MAP patients who were admitted to the um, Del Seton Medical Center initiated on buprenorphine am i still there guys sorry it's still here yeah um the and what it shows is that we measure our success by how well we're able to retain people in care as they move from left to right along the continuum next slide please and i'm going to turn it over to my colleague josh now to talk a little bit about our, our clinic 
Thank, thank you, Dr. Weems. And of course, uh, good afternoon to our managers and our uh, members of the subcommittee. Uh, I want to uh, just kind of give a high level uh, portrayal of where we're at and what our model actually looks like. Uh, you know, Dr. Weems, we're talking about the cascade of care uh, and we want to address where some of those gaps live and uh, provide some recommendations on where we think uh, central health and most importantly from a strategic approach, uh, where we think some of our efforts should lie in the upcoming uh, year or years as we think about uh, substance abuse and opioid use disorder and how as a system we, we treat that. So right now we utilize a hub and spoke model, very familiar concept in medicine, uh, but it took us a little bit to get here. Our, our program is about four years old and uh, a little bit of trial and error uh, to get us to where we currently are at at Southeast Health and Wellness. Uh, you know, lessons learned with uh, needing to have a pharmacy on site to facilitate that immediate access to medication and really being able to house all our partners and all <laughs> aspects of the team of care uh, to be able to provide not only the medication, but uh, access to social services and to wraparound support for counseling. Uh, really our first partners in this, uh, of course, integral care right now uh, provides our wrap around services for the program. Uh, but in terms of external, uh, external patients coming in, we formulated a strong partnership with our partners at, eight, at uh, Austin Travis County EMS, uh, particularly with the CHIP program. Uh, they work side on side and even till, to this day with our street medicine team out uh, all around Austin and Travis County, uh, basically mapping out where some of the heroin um, camps are and being able to jump right in there and provide immediate access, not only to naloxone, which is life-saving in an overdose situation, but also if patients are ready and have hit that stage of change, immediate access to uh, buprenorphine, and then ideally getting them into the clinic setting if, if they're willing and ready to do that. Uh, we talked a little bit, or Dr. Williams mentioned a little bit about the B team. This was a game changer for us uh, and really is still a little bit of work to do uh, in the inpatient and the ED setting, I think, uh, as an opportunity for us as we grow. Uh, but this really uh, was a game changer because you had patients who were inpatient for something else, identified a need of uh, substance abuse or opioid use. They get started on the medication right there at the hospital and they're actually able to transfer right in to care with us and we're able to manage them long-term. And of course, word of mouth is really, really important in our community, especially with a high percentage of our population being homeless, uh, not necessarily having that trust of the healthcare system or any sort of engagement. So if they're hearing from their friends and, and uh, campmates that, hey, you know, I'm on this life sick medication, I'm not using anymore, uh, we've been able to get patients in that way as well. From a long-term approach, we want to start pushing those services out, especially for our patients that over time have become lower on the acuity scale. They've been easier to manage. Patients, someone like Juan, like uh, Dr. Weems just mentioned, where they've made it through the toughest time of recovery and now they're able to self-manage. Right now we have three spoke sites, uh, primarily in the South. Uh, we hope to have two more coming online in the next month or two up North. Uh, but right now out of David Powell's South, uh, South Austin Care Connections, we see a lot, we're able to push some of our patients out to, to make more room for patients coming in who are kind of at that first stage of wanting to change. The next slide, please. So, of course, we can't do this alone. Uh, I love this quote uh, from Mother Teresa. Uh, what can, you can do what I cannot do. I can do what you cannot do, but together we can do great things. We, we can't do this alone. There's so many great partners in the community. And I know a few slides ago, Dr. Weems showed kind of this patient at the center and there's still a little bit of convolutedness around what the system looks like. I think as we're thinking strategically moving forward, it's about how do we unite the, uh, the system and make it actually work for the patient instead of the patient having to work to make all these pieces come together and and end up in a situation like patient Juan, right? So uh, we wouldn't be here without some of our partners, uh, of course, like Central Health, making uh, things like funding possible, uh, and some of our partners, a new entry in Senecor, uh, for our patients that actually get insurance throughout the process. A lot of our patients come in with MAP, 
but the goal is to get them on their feet. A lot of our patients end up finding jobs and are then able to get uh, private insurance and then we're able to connect them with different resources as well. Uh, next slide. So really when you think, when we're thinking strategically, uh, gaps in care really fall into three buckets. And I think this is the way we can address this in a long-term approach or even a short-term approach as well. It's really about navigation, education, and medications. I'm going to leave medications over to Dr. Weems in a moment, but really want to talk about the importance of navigation. Again, we talked, we looked at the slide where you know, patient, one of our patients, Justin, said he wouldn't even design a system this way. Uh, I think Central Health has grown uh, their uh, care management team immensely, and We've seen that in some of our vulnerable populations. Uh, I think I we were presenting with Dr. Huang a month or two uh, right here in this very setting where case management and having those social work resources, it does work. And it, it's given us the opportunity to be successful and, and manage and be successful with those transitions of care. Education, you know, first and foremost, of course, for the patient. Uh, and this is where we'll talk about peer recovery coaches and what that may look like uh, as we transition to that over the next year, or hope to at least, but more so education, not only for our staff, but for our stakeholders, uh, so we can really truly uh, move the needle in, in uh, minimizing stigma and removing the negative connotations of, of use. And of course, uh, medications I'll leave to Dr. Weaves. Next slide. So this is a slide that uh, Dr. Kwong put together, uh, really showing how if you're able to satisfy some of the minimum needs, uh, especially for our homeless patients, for example, uh, taking care of shelter, food, uh, that really gives you the opportunity to focus on not only medical care, but also social aspects of care. And this is why it's it, the hub model is really important uh, and that these medications work in a primary care setting, right? So of course the key focus is medication, right? You get that from your physician, but it's really about the interaction with support staff, uh, you know, lower levels of care, lower needs, so you can delegate to your nurse, but really where the magic happens is connection to psychiatry and psychology. You know, we estimate anywhere between 50 to 60, 65% of our patients have at least one uh, moderate to severe mental, uh, mental health disorder, uh, but also the critical piece is that social work case management piece where it's great that uh, we're getting clean and off the medication, but what are the next steps? Now that you're not worried about addiction and, and where your next fix is gonna come from, how do we move you along and, and get you back into society, get you back to a job uh, and move forward with just getting your life back? And it's, we've seen this so successful with some of our patients that we've been able to help get through the housing maze, especially here in Austin, where uh, while it's a high cost model, in the long run, really the value is, again, decreasing those readmissions and that utilization of the ED, and then ultimately uh, moving patients forward through the system. Uh, next slide. And then lastly, really want to drive this home, and I, I know Dr. Weems has plenty to say about our recovery coaches as well. Uh, it's something that doesn't necessarily exist within our infrastructure yet. I know we partner uh, right now in street medicine with uh, with a peer recovery agency, kind of in a pilot phase, and it's yielded some pretty great results. Uh, and more so because we want those with lived experience to really be the ones who who, who propagate change. Right? Uh, it can't be just you and me because we know the numbers and the value and the medications. We need others out there in the system that know what this experience is like to be able to change the idea of stigma to reduce stigma and continuing education for our staff and for our stakeholders as well. Again, I'll, I'll turn it back over to Dr. Weems to take this home. Ready for the Sorry for the IT issues. Can anybody hear me? Uh, I can hear you. Um, well said, ready for the next slide, please. Um, the, 
I think Josh said this really well earlier. Education is needed to reduce stigma. Um, uh, having an addiction is the most stigmatized condition on earth, um, according to the WHO. And that's been demonstrated over and over in different surveys that show the majority of people feel in the general public and us in healthcare share this um, bias as well, that people with addiction problems are making a series of bad choices instead of their people with an illness who are suffering. And so a lot of the work is, is stigma reduction. Uh, and why is it so important? It's, it's not just being politically correct. It's creating access to hospitable care for people who have a serious illness. And fear of mistreatment keeps patients out of care. And so education is, I think, one of the, like Josh said, one of the real opportunities across stakeholders um, as we do this work. And peer recovery coaches are a key part of, of that work. Next slide, please. Um, and I think this slides again, I mentioned earlier, for opioid use disorder, medications are um, more effective than treatments we have in any other area of medicine, reducing mortality. We are, we are really fortunate at the um, MAT clinic to have access to buprenorphine for our patients. And I think expanding medication access uh, across different addictive disorders is a huge priority. Here you can see that um, the folks with an addiction problem off treatment have a standardized mortality ratio of six times that of the general population. And that recedes dramatically uh, with medications and really emphasizing that um, there's a huge opportunity here uh, to offer access to this medication. Next slide. I think we've arrived at our conclusion slide. So uh, a couple of takeaways uh, we hope for everybody is that substance use disorder is a common chronic condition responsible to treatment. Without care, people um, with addiction suffer morbidity and mortality. Treatment can be integrated into general medical settings and should be. And community voices, especially those of lived experiences of substance use, should drive system development. And that um, opportunities and gaps in our, for um, the system currently serving our MAP patients include improvements in navigation, education, um, and increased access uh, to medication. That's it. Thanks so much. Thank you, Dr. Weems. Go ahead, Monica. All right, Dr. Bell. Dr. Bell, there's um, another presentation on um, primary care behavioral health. And I, I think, um, you know, for you, that's another uh, lengthy presentation. And I, I, I'm not sure if you want to take questions now on this part of the presentation or move on to the um, primary care behavioral health presentation and then take questions at, at the end. Well, I'm sure Dr. Weems is pretty busy, so uh, I would like to go ahead and open it up for board members to ask questions while he's available, and then we'll go into the next presentation. So members, if you have any questions or comments with regard to the presentation by Dr. Weems and Josh Rivera, um, raise your hand, let me know, give me a signal. Okay, uh, since I know that uh, Manager Jones is going to yield uh, to Manager Valadez, so I will go with Manager Valadez first and then Manager Jones. You're muted. You're muted, Manager Valadez. You're muted, Manager Valadez. I was going to get, uh, let Amit go because I haven't heard from him, and, and, then, uh, and then we can do. Okay, well, I will recognize. Uh, <laughs> thank, uh, thank, thank you all both. Uh, and uh, really just commentary. Uh, I loved uh, the profundity of this presentation. I, just, I was just learning every second through it. And I uh, want to just applaud uh, Dr. Weems and Josh uh, for being who you are, as well as so many of the brilliant staff uh, uh, at Central Health, the practitioners, uh, practitioners, providers, administrators, everybody along the line, and to see, you know, folks who are experts in the field, like Dr. Reams, who are not just expert practitioners uh, and have a full body of, uh, of, of deep professional understanding at levels that we can't conceptualize in the work that they do, but then to be able to distill this 
and do presentations and instructives, uh, big picture analyses uh, for us to be able to digest, I think is, 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 is a very difficult to put a finger on, on that kind of talent. And for us to have that, in, in, and uh, you too, Josh, as well, and, and for us to have that kind of talent uh, so pervasive in this organization, because we see it over and over again. At the last strategic planning meeting, uh, uh, we had similar instructives. And I, I'm just moved, and it makes me feel so comfortable when, uh, when I know that if I ask a question um, from a guidance or governance standpoint, that I nearly always feel so comfortable giving the benefit of the doubt to staff and to leadership, knowing that they're making such fantastically informed decisions. Uh, and to know, you know, I think the one risk might be is that, you know, you can be an informed staff member, but you may not see the forest through the trees, but seeing how well our staff and team are working now with the analytics department to be able to see the forest through the trees and convey that to us uh, in a closed loop fashion and a continually improving fashion too. And recognizing those limitations is very impressive and I appreciate it. Thank you, Manager Matwani, and um, I like to echo many of the sentiments that you outlined. Um, this is an excellent presentation, definitely uh, directed toward individuals who uh, need to understand uh, addiction, uh, but need to understand it in a way that you have outlined, Dr. Weems and Josh, um, so that we know that it is a chronic disease, and it's one that can be addressed with the same strategies that we address other chronic diseases in. Manager Valadez. Yes, um, I, I echo everything, but uh, am, am truly moved um, by the, that y'all having reached this point in the modeling, I can see this, that you need to uh, continue to expand and you may need uh, money uh, to access those additional resources enabled, and enabling you to do that. I've lived in a world where I've, I, my daughter is special needs, but she was in a, on a campus, Rosedale campus, which is across from the school for the deaf. And there, right across from her classroom was where the children, I mean, young children uh, that had extreme violent, uh, I guess, pr propensity towards violence or, or whatever uh, were located and, and aggressive behaviors. My daughter, can exhibit aggressive behaviors if she wasn't on some of the meds that she's on. Um, and so having lived through that as a mother, as a family member and a care provider, my biggest problem always ended up being the transition periods or the changes with staff, changes with case managers, having to reinvent the wheel every time that happened. Uh, that is extremely difficult, not only for the child transitioning into uh, uh, the, uh, the middle school to the secondary system, to the street, um, because they had family members that could no longer control children uh, that may have reached junior high age or middle school age. They were too big. Uh, they were too violent. Uh, parents didn't have the, uh, the sufficient training and wraparound services and education to be able to hand handle uh, their, their own children that became adults and then are, are in the streets because you can see the progression over a, a lifespan of these populations that are so vulnerable. And so it, I just have to tell you, I really appreciate everything that you're saying and everything you're talking about. And I have screamed for, for respite systems for parents or family members to, while they're in the respite systems, the siblings and the parents and the families are getting supports, getting training and educated educated about how to address their family member. Uh, the family member then going into maybe for, for a period of time dealing with centers or uh, if they, they were in-house with you all, work with them and show them that they're gonna be in a nurturing, safe environment uh, that's not gonna be judging them, that's not gonna be beating them, or that's not gonna be telling them things that are negative and just ramp up the need to escape through whatever mess, uh, whatever manner they can. And I just want to tell you that I appreciate it, but that is something with integral care and with our, our system of, of, uh, of care, we really need to work on. And that is the cross training of the, the teams that are working with these, with these children and adults uh, because they need 
someone in their court all the time that is understanding and working with them through whatever their lived experiences are. And that also means that the staffs have to be linguistically and culturally able to work with the families because that's where a big disconnect is when you're dealing with, with family members that, that don't have the ability to communicate with their case managers or their, uh, or their care providers. And uh, anyway, I just, I just wanna thank you all. I want you all to increase uh, what, I hope we can give additional funding to them because this is something that is impacting and tripling as far as I'm concerned due to <laughs> pandemics uh, and, and uh, stress crisis situations. That's just gonna triple you know, what's happening in a, in a, in a family or, or to a person when, they're, when they have no resources. That, I can see it in, in homelessness, but I'm wondering whether or not you all have baselines for uh, maybe the demographics or the histories to know where they came from, how this might have, uh, is, it, was it a genetic propensity? Was it an environmental uh, snap that occurred? You know, something. And then that's how in getting to know that level of uh, uh, that almost like a, a medical uh, a genealogy or a medical whatever um, is so much help and, and why it it's really exacer exacerbates the problem when you're having to constantly change constantly change uh, case managers uh, and and go through that. So I just uh, I just I just want to thank you all and and Mike and board. <laughs> We really need to support this because mental and behavioral health is, is such an issue, a real issue for all of us. So thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you very, very much, Manager Valadez. Manager Jones? Yeah, I'd like to join my colleagues in acknowledging the great work and the great presentation. This was very, very helpful. As one who started my career in public health in uh, substance use abuse uh, back in the last century, I'll just say that. Uh, it's important to understand the role that substance use plays. My, I just have a couple of quick questions. One is, did you look at the role that legal prescriptive drugs plays upon the impact on transition into illegal drugs such as uh, um, heroin and cocaine and the like? Is there a, seems to be a trend, that's the first thing. The second one is relates sort to what uh, Manager Valdez said is, family, uh, the impact family trends has. If you see it in the family, do you, is that genetically connected? Is there any way to be able to do that, or predispose that either as, based upon race and or gender or whatever? I, I didn't know if you see any trends in that. And then the other thing is how do we inculcate into our system of care the impact that prescriptive drugs play on ultimately illegal use for those in our society? Uh, particularly for populations who don't have resources to be able to manage their, uh, their, their substance use. So those are the only things I'd like to uh, ask, but a great presentation. And if you have any comments on that, I appreciate it. Thanks. Okay. Uh, unless someone wrote those down, we might have to have you repeat them. Uh, who wants to take the first question? Uh, Dr. Weems? Thank, thanks y'all for um, having us in the generous comments. Um, we get to serve really incredible patients and it makes it fulfilling work and hopefully we're bringing some of that to, to this um, forum. Um, for the first question of the role of prescription drugs in furthering um, uh, transition to higher risk drugs, do I, do I have that right? Is that kind of the first question? Um, so it's, it's very clear that um, increased prescribing, particularly opioid pain medications in the 90s and early 2000s fueled the rise of the opioid use disorder epidemic we have and the subsequent opioid overdose epidemic, right? So people have the illness, many of whom die from the illness. Um, and that is what started this. I think there's, it's uh, not a total consensus, but I think many would say that that's how we got into this trouble. But don't forget, like these are vulnerable populations with the genetic chance of this illness. So it's a more complicated story. Right. But the, um, uh, the, problem that started the epidemic is not the problem that's now sustaining the epidemic. And so there has been a clampdown on the prescription of opioid medications appropriately in many cases for more judicious prescribing. And I think this gets to your third 
um, questions like how do we stop fueling the fire, basically, if I, if I have your third question correct. Mm -hmm. So judicious prescribing is in, really important and um, it's part of preventative efforts to prevent opioid use disorder because if opioids aren't in our communities then folks aren't gonna be exposed to them so much, so, so the logic goes. The challenge is that the drug supply is poisoned and increasingly dangerous for people who are exposed to opioids and that is what's fueling the meteoric rise in overdose deaths now. So I think, I hope to answer your question. So yes, injudicious prescribing definitely had a role. It's unclear if that continues to fuel the crisis or if it's these other factors, these social vulnerabilities that Dr. Swanson are gonna speak of and the adverse childhood experiences um, that lead to vulnerability um, to addiction. I hope that that helps answer those. And there's a lot that I left out there and, and um, it's a great and complicated topic, but I hope that gives a a little bit of a sense. Thank you very much. Yes, it does. Okay, thank you, Manager Jones. Uh, very quick, Cynthia. It's going to be very quick. Uh, I just want to make sure that that, that you know, um, addictive behaviors is not necessarily due to to um, opioid abuse. We also have things that have that there could be medical conditions. There could be something neurological that's going on. Whatever, but. But if you're seeing this uh, behavior, addictive behavior exhibited, let's say in a child, uh, one of the disconnects also that I've seen with respect to education and understanding is the inability for, let's say, integral care or your MHMR component to work with the special education or uh, di diagnosticians that are in the school systems. And not only that, with the therapists that are in the school systems, uh, uh, having them have a complete understanding, working with the team in a holistic way, um, that that's a lot to do with how the family is is uh, educated or not educated, trained or not trained. And so I just want to make sure that y'all don't forget that those transitions and those interactions and those cross trainings really are key to trying to stay on top of what's happening at each stage of a person's life. Thank you very much, Manager Valadez. Um, I think Dr. Schulzer wants to introduce our next speaker. And uh, again, thank you, Dr. Williams and Mr. Rivera. Excellent presentation, uh, great information. Dr. Schulzer. Thank you, Dr. Bell. Um, I'd like to introduce Dr. John Swanson. Um, Dr. Swanson also hails from Massachusetts. Um, he is a psychiatrist and we've spoken you know, many times about the critical need um, to expand behavioral health in the primary care environment. Um, Dr. Swanson has worked both in the public and the private sector and has a, a, a myriad of, of uh, a, or a significant amount of experience in, in both environments. Um, he specializes on pediatric psychiatry um, and has been with community care for about three months. So as with everybody, we welcome people by asking them to really summate the care environment and present that to the strategic planning committee within three months of them arriving. Um, we also wanted to thank Heather Hart Goss um, for her management of the behavioral health department before um, Dr. Swanson um, got here. And, um, and thank you, John, for, uh, for your preparation of this. And I will turn this over to you. Uh, thank you so much. And thank you for the opportunity to um, uh, talk to the um, board of managers at Central Health. And I especially thank uh, John and Monica for their support and help as well. And, and Dr. Shalsha and Dr. Yagoda at Community Care um, who have been uh, incredibly supportive to me and, and behavioral health in general. Um, our department is now I think about a year old and we have probably 30 to 35 people in the department. And I would say that we uh, work in maybe three different kind of capacities. One is psychiatric services, which includes myself and three nurse practitioners. Then we have um, a licensed clinical social workers who are working in embedded in the primary care clinics, um, doing the uh, primary care behavioral health model, uh, which is an evidence-based model. And then we have uh, uh, various social workers who are working in the intensive outpatient treatment programs uh, like um, the David Powell Clinic, or the Healthcare for the Homeless, or High Risk OB. So that's our team. Um, and in this presentation, I'm going to be talking mostly about the work that we do with regard to mental illness. Um, 
but we do an equal amount of work and important work uh, addressing the behavioral aspects of medical care as well. So um, I'm not gonna be focusing on that in this presentation. Hmm. We cannot hear you. It, yeah, he froze on my screen. And yep. so I gather he's frozen on everybody else's screen. Mm -hmm. uh, he's, he's logged off, he'll come back on. There he is. I'm sorry, but my inter internet connection is a little bit shaky. Of, um, I'm gonna talk a little bit about the ACES study and how that could in a way be a model for the way we think about our intervention within primary care. Um, and then I'm gonna talk about sort of the prioritized needs and goals going forward uh, with the behavioral health department. So this first slide is just uh, a, a little bit of information about prevalence. Interestingly, about 40% of the population last year, which was during the pandemic, reported some difficulties with mental health and substance use uh, problems. Uh, another, another interesting uh, statistic is about a half of all mental illnesses began by the age of 14. That really mm -hmm. highlights the importance of early, early detection and early intervention. And then uh, this is a, another commonly quoted statistic, uh, which is that the, the uh, time delay between the onset of mental illness and the typical uh, access to treatment is about 11 years. Right. So next slide. This is, this is also a slide, and I'm gonna, I'm gonna move through these very quickly. Another slide that gives a little bit of information about uh, prevalence. Uh, and I want you to note the, the bottom uh, statistic, which is that uh, anxiety disorders are actually the most common mental illness. Um, and about 18% of the population, uh, adult population suffers from an anxiety disorder. Uh, next slide. This slide, uh, the, the the graph of the United States breaks down the common uh, mental, mental illnesses, anxiety disorders being by far the most common. Depression in this slide says about 8%. And this is just in the past year. Um, you know, what is the prevalence uh, of these disorders in the last year? Um, so in community care, since we think of ourselves as addressing sort of mild to moderate mental illness as opposed to serious mental illness. Serious mental illness or SMI affects about 5% of the population, that one in 20 statistic um, in, the, in the top of the, of the slide. That's, the, uh, that's really primarily the work of integral care. They are charged with um, treating um, and managing folks with serious mental illness. We are gonna be focused on people with, uh, uh, you know, about the 15 to 20% of the population that has mild or moderate mental illness. And so that's gonna be anxiety disorders, depression, uh, dual diagnosis, which is um, where you have mental illness and uh, substance use disorder. Um, and then also some um, post-traumatic stress disorder. On the right side, it, it talks about the, the uh, prevalence uh, within different racial groups. Um, so next slide. Uh, this, this graph uh, just highlights how the prevalence of depression, depression uh, in the last year among teenagers uh, from the last decade to the current decade has gone up substantially. So in, in the you know, early 2000s, about 8% of the uh, um, teenagers uh, suffered from depression. And this is major depression, which is significant depression. Uh, whereas in this most recent decade, it's about 13%. So big increase in, in depression among teenagers. Next slide. This slide highlights um, difficulty in access. So um, uh, this is uh, the percentage of people who have a, a diagnosable mental illness that actually access treatment. So in the last decade, it was about 35% of people with mental illness access treatment. And in this decade, it's, it's about uh, 39%. So, so there's lots of room uh, to provide better access. Next slide. This is uh, it, um, data from um, Central Health about the MAP population. Um, so in, in the year two, uh, 2020, 
uh, MAP had about 92,000 people enrolled and about 20,000 of those folks uh, suffered from a diagnosable mental illness. So that's about 22%. That's, that is roughly um, consistent with sort of national prevalence um, averages. And, and yet one would think that the MAP population would have a higher prevalence of, of mental illness just because of the uh, disadvantaged circumstances of most of the folks that are enrolled in MAP. Um, and, it, and it breaks down uh, for Travis County and for MAP enrolled people um, uh, who have a um, diagnosable mental health problem you know, what is the, what is sort of the racial uh, breakdown of that? And we see that um, the Hispanic, you know, we have a larger Hispanic group of Hispanic patients um, within MAP. Next, next slide. Also, um, this is uh, of the, of the 22% of, of patients enrolled in MAP, you know, what, what kind of uh, behavioral health disorders do they have? Um, and interestingly, this doesn't include the anxiety disorders, which would be in fact, the most prevalent but you can see that depression is super common um, among the folks who have uh, mental health disorders. Um, substance use disorders are also common. Bipolar disorder uh, and, and schizophrenia and psychotic disorders, again, are gonna be more in the category of serious mental illness. And we're gonna try to refer as, uh, those folks to, to integral care, although, you know, uh, our, our work at community care being a safety net program, we do end up caring for and bridging uh, many of those patients until they can get into the more appropriate level of care. Next slide. And this is more specifically uh, in community care. So in 2019, this is out of a, out of a, a total number of a hundred, about 120,000 patients served by community care in, in 2019, and 15,000 had a diagnosed mental health disorder. That is a, a big underestimate or a, a big underdetection of, of mental health disorders. And I think it just suggests that, <clears throat> that we could you know, do better and provide uh, more access to, to people. Um, depression and anxiety being the most common pre presenting problems. Next slide. So now I wanted to just, after just giving you a little bit of, of basic uh, prevalence information, I wanted to talk a little uh, about some of the patients that we're seeing in community care. To kind of give you an idea of what, what are the sort of common problems that present in, in our setting, in our primary care setting. So um, this T is a 15 year old African-American youth who um, is a very sweet, sensitive and responsible uh, young man. He came in with his mother. Um, his uh, two mothers had separated and, and had had uh, a difficult time with that separation. The mother he was living with um, herself suffered from bipolar disorder and had recently been assaulted. And um, this, um, young guy uh, presented with a lot of anxiety and what we would what we would think of as sort of PTSD symptoms, you know, being fearful, startling easily, trouble sleeping. Uh, and he even had a <clears throat> significant dissociative episode. Uh, so he, he presented for help with depression and anxiety. Next slide. <coughs> um, this is a woman, a 49 year old Spanish speaking woman who, um, who was experiencing homelessness and she came to our attention because she had been visiting the emergency room frequently uh, with complaints of shortness of breath and thinking that she had asthma. Um, and she was really um, focused on, on, on the fact that she had asthma. Um, she had had medical workup, which was a negative for, for pulmonary disease. Um, she had also suffered a great deal of weight loss, about 50 pounds over you know, the course of six months to a year. She arrived at the clinic, um, dropped off in a wheelchair <clears throat> because she, she was weak and had trouble walking. She came into the clinic unscheduled and um, you know, the, the primary care um, doctor had actually already talked to me about this uh, woman and, and we had kind of thought about how we might be helpful to her. So uh, we were able to um, uh, just very quickly um, um, you know, in a coordinated way, evaluate her 
um, along with the, with the help of the care manager and, and begin a treatment for depression. I, hard to know whether that was the underlying cause of her problems, but it, it seemed like it was uh, worth uh, ad uh, attempting to address. Okay, next slide. <coughs> Z is a um, young, young boy um, who uh, presented, he was with his mom and his grandmother and he's a very sweet, uh, sweet uh, little guy and uh, presented just in a very classic way um, that kids with ADHD present. You know, his, his family was saying, uh, being still is not his thing. And, and, it, and it wasn't, but uh, he was a very bright and otherwise healthy boy. Yet he did have the added complication that his father had died when he was two from a gunshot wound. Next slide. <coughs> um, H is a, was a, is a 58 year old Arabic speaking woman who, um, who presented uh, because her primary complaint was that she had memory problems and concentration problems and she couldn't um, study for her uh, citizenship exam. Turns out after, after interviewing her that um, she has lots of anxiety related to trauma that she suffered in Iraq. Um, and she was literally trying to sleep during the day to avoid people. She was staying up all night long and was still suffering from depression. <clears throat> Next slide. And then finally, I um, was a young, young man who um, was also, uh, you know, responsible and, uh, and, and very polite young man presented with his grandmother because um, he had been in Oklahoma with his mother and had been hospitalized a few times uh, in Oklahoma. Um, and then Child Protective Services insisted that he go live with his grandmother because he was suffering uh, physical abuse by mother's um, partner. Um, he had been diagnosed with bipolar disorder and treated with a lot of medication <clears throat> in the hospital. And it seemed like at his grandmother's house, he had less of a need for that medication and probably his symptoms were much more related to trauma as opposed to bipolar disorder. Okay, next slide. So I, I, I wanted to uh, talk about those, those few vignettes and those are just samples of, of, of patients that I have seen. And, and I think what, what uh, has come up, um, clear to me is that trauma is a very significant part of the clinical presentation of many of our, our patients. And so I wanted to talk a little bit about the ACEs study because that has a bearing on both uh, mental illness and physical illness as it relates to adverse childhood experiences. So ACEs stands for adverse childhood experiences. And these are just the two citations, a couple of citations about some of the big studies related to the ACEs. Next slide. <coughs> And so the, the original ACEs study was done in the late 1990s at, at Kaiser Permanente in California with the assistance of the CDC. And they developed a questionnaire that had 10 basic questions that related to adverse childhood experiences. And you can see these are, the, these are essentially what they were asking about, um, actual abuse, the neglect, and then various family challenges including mental illness, substance use disorder, domestic violence, and what have you. And what they discovered, this was originally, the original study was of a middle-class um, cohort, about 18,000 people in an outpatient clinic in, I think, San Diego, California. And they discovered that there were, uh, you know, the, the, the uh, prevalence of these adverse childhood experiences were way more than anybody had had ever expected or imagined. And what they did then, go to the next slide, is they added up the number of ACEs. So out of 10, you know, how many, how many of these adverse childhood experiences have you, have you had? And they <clears throat> discovered that the larger number of adverse childhood experiences that a person had, the greater their risk of having various uh, medical problems uh, later in life, including heart disease, diabetes, high blood pressure, obesity, et cetera, et cetera. So they were at much greater risk of physical disease but as well as mental health problems. Next slide. And so this is, this is just a, a graph that, that um, describes the sort of mechanism that they hypothesized that 
is the, the cause, you know, going from adverse childhood experiences to having um, physical health uh, problems. So adverse childhood experiences through the sort of mechanism of what's called toxic stress, where you have persistent, you know, a release of stress hormones and in the absence of a caring, nurturing environment, that that does uh, considerable damage to brain development, which then leads to various social, emotional, cognitive impairments, which then leads to the adoption of, of um, you know, health risk behaviors. Um, and then that leads to, you know, compounded medical and uh, behavioral health problems. Next slide. Um, and so, you know, the question is, well, what do you do about it? That's, you know, that's kind of the, uh, the, um, the sort of next step is we, we have a, a good understanding about ACEs and the impact of ACEs. So what do you do about it? And so there is a lot of study about how do you build resilience and, you know, it, it, it is based on probably three basic principles. One is, is understanding what trauma and adverse childhood experiences do to people and um, what the impact is uh, of trauma and understanding that and, and, uh, and uh, uh, addressing people, not, not what's wrong with you, but what happened to you and mm -hmm. creating safe environments for them um, and um, creating sort of trust um, with them. Mm -hmm. uh, so that's important uh, as well as helping people develop the ability to manage emotions. So with trauma and adverse childhood experiences, it, it, it fundamentally undermines your ability to manage emotions. You're always in a kind of heightened arousal, fight, flight, freeze uh, response mode. And, um, and so people react in ways that are extreme. All right, next slide. <clears throat> so if, if we were to uh, be able to intervene with ACEs, what would be the impact down the line in terms of reduction of health problems? And so this is an analysis by the CDC of, of how we would reduce a number of physical health problems as well as health risk behaviors and also uh, social problems just by addressing uh, ACEs. Next, next slide. So uh, how, how do we think about the needs of the folks uh, that, that we serve at community care? Um, first and uh, foremost is, is related to access. And um, so our, our patients need very flexible scheduling you know, for, for, for uh, behavioral health. Um, so we need to make it super easy for them um, because they have all kinds of disadvantages in terms of transportation, access, resources, and what have you. Um, there's a relatively uh, short supply of community-based services uh, for, for, for people with mental, mental health problems in general, but, but certainly for these people who have more mild to moderate problems. Uh, trauma is a complicating factor very frequently. We need to have, uh, have very good evidence-based treatments for the primary presenting uh, mental health problems that we will see, which are depression, anxiety, substance use disorders, post-traumatic stress disorder, and then um, pediatric uh, ADHD. We are, we are well positioned to provide education about mental health and trauma. Uh, and then um, as Dr. Weins uh, pr presented, there's this high-risk population that we um, that we serve at community care, that we need to collaborate with Dr. Weems' team with addiction and recovery um, and the, um, you know, the, to, to uh, help with the, the medical needs, mental health needs uh, of homeless people. Um, okay, next slide. <clears throat> so th these are sort of the guiding principles based on, you know, where, where do we fit in sort of the, the system of care in, in Travis County? And who are the patients that we see? And what, what, are, what are the um, services that are best suited to this primary care model? I think uh, education uh, about mental health trauma, uh, addiction, what have you. There's much that we can do about with in that, in that arena. 
yeah. uh, we need to provide very uh, quick and easy access uh, to mental health services. We need to intervene early, thereby reducing the overall burden of, of mental illness. We need to be trauma informed and have specialized trauma treatments, um, which now there's an abundance of evidence-based treatments. Uh, and we need to do all of this stuff in an excellent way. Next slide. So it, it, these, are, these are just some sort of, uh, um, some areas uh, of education that, that, uh, that, that I think would be very important. And I won't go into all of them, but, but I will touch on the last two. Um, there, there is a model uh, that is a group model of treatment called mindfulness-based stress reduction. It was uh, developed by a fellow named John Kabat-Zinn in, in Massachusetts. It's very well described, uh, evidence-based, has great uh, impact on both physical health problems and mental health problems. It'd be great if we could institute something like that at community care. And then uh, the other one that I wanted to highlight is parenting groups. So if we're thinking about helping to address um, adverse childhood experiences, we need to, we need to help the, the kids, we need to help the parents, we need to help the grandparents, we need to help right. the systems. And for those people who, who did not um, themselves have positive parenting experiences, we need to help them to learn. Um, and so having a parent training um, uh, option, I think would be very helpful. The Incredible Years is my personal favorite because it's based on um, what's called videotape modeling. And uh, you, you basically watch videos of how to do it and how not to do it. Next slide. <clears throat> so again, access, um, make it super easy and flexible. And um, some clinics that I've, that I've known about um, have a policy of sort of three strikes and you're out. Um, meaning that if you miss three appointments, they discharge you from the clinic. And, and I think our policy should be three strikes and you're in. And Thank you. uh, so we, we figure out how, how to, how to uh, reach out to you and how to overcome the barriers uh, to, to service. Uh, next slide. <clears throat> Again, um, these are the, the clinical pathways that I think that we need to develop and develop it with expertise. And we may want to, we are embedded in clinics. We may want to at some point have some, some services that are provided in a separate location that, that would be able to um, serve intermediate level um, behavioral health needs. Um, th there's, you know, there's, there's many benefits to being embedded in the clinic. You have a much better integration of care. There might be some benefits to having some locations that are not necessarily embedded right in the clinic. Um, to give us more flexibility um, and, and uh, be able to do a little bit more intermediate level care. So I've listed a number of, of, of kind of evidence-based treatment models, and I won't get into that. Cognitive behavioral therapy is, is one that you may have heard about. Motivational interviewing is common in the, in the world of addiction. Um, next slide. Uh, and again, um, this whole, the whole um, topic of trauma and, and understanding of the impact of trauma and, and how important that is for systems of care. Um, and, and so many people call that a trauma-informed care initiative. Uh, we'll want to uh, develop something like that. And then we also want to develop uh, specific brief trauma treatments. And here's a list of some of the, the trauma treatments that would be important. Next slide. And then finally, special populations where we, where we want to increasingly develop collaborations with Dr. Weems and, and uh, Josh's team in addictions recovery and with a healthcare for the homeless um, and, and with Central Health and with Dell Medical Center uh, to proactively address the needs of these complex patients who, who very frequently end up in the emergency room and in the hospital. Um, Next slide. Uh, and this is just a list of like, uh, well, what do, what do we do first? You know, what are some of the sort of to-do list? And this is sort of some of the, the to-do list of things, you know, for probably the next year. Um, we're we're going to need to hire some more people. Our department is growing. We are not, um, we're not staffed enough to be able to meet all the needs. Um, 
So that will be uh, important. We're gonna start a weekly case conference for our team to uh, uh, both uh, build a sense of, of um, belonging and support within the team and also ongoing training. And I won't go through all of these um, uh, different details, but you can read them later. Next slide. Why should we do this? Um, you know, we're all, we're all devoted uh, to the idea of health equity. Um, by, by intervening with, with young people, particularly young parents, young kids, uh, and, and the family system, then we have the opportunity to interrupt this cycle of ACEs, which, which I think would be very important. Um, and we're particularly well positioned to be educators and, uh, and leaders in terms of what health recovery and well being means. So uh, I think that's the end of my presentation. Um, there may be ones there. There's my uh, team, my wonderful team of, uh, of people um, that I'm so grateful for. Thank you so much, Dr. Swanson. Um, excellent information. Um, Jonathan? Well, I'd, I'd like to uh, quickly introduce uh, Nakasha Leonard as one of our service delivery operations managers that works in this area for behavioral health and substance use and post-acute care and many other things. I think she's got one more slide here uh, to talk about the proposed initiatives that are related to the materials that um, Dr. Weems and Dr. Swanson and Josh uh, just spoke to. Great. Good afternoon. Forgive my voice. I'm under the weather today. <laughs> uh, <laughs> um, but for our FY22 proposed initiatives, we have um, enhanced, enhanced behavioral health access in primary care, substance use disorder care um, transitions, peer support specialist counseling for substance use disorder, and the street and mobile medicine for behavioral health access for the homeless. And then I think John is next up. And uh, Dr. Bell, um, I, I hope the committee uh, finds this as instructive and inspiring as the group of us that have had the opportunity to work with uh, this group of gentlemen and others over the past few months. Um, I, I want to point out that I, I think this is a, a good preview of the systems planning work that we're doing. Uh, this is just the beginning, uh, but this is also a great showcase of the uh, the type of clinical and operational subject matter experts that uh, we are blessed to have at Community Care and to have uh, working with us here at Central Health and doing this planning. So uh, a lot more of this to come. And again, just want to thank the thank our guests for their their time today and uh, the the hours and hours that have gone into uh, preparing for this work uh, this afternoon. Um, Dr. Bell, do you want to pause briefly for? questions for uh, Dr. Swanson before we move into the last part of the presentation? Yes, I would. And uh, managers, um, if you have any questions or comments, uh, please uh, raise your hand. I've got three or two right now that I've seen. Um, I would ask you to be as concise as possible because we are now at 335. And um, although the next agenda item is just uh, board packet information, uh, we still have a part B to go through under this agenda item. So I will ask Chair Greenberg to go first and then Manager Valadez. Thank you. Um, I just have a very concise statement and that applies to every Thing, all the presentations we have seen so far, and I'll make it apply to what I know we're going to see in the rest of that meeting, and that is I am literally speechless. Uh, thank you to all of our staff everywhere who have contributed to this work. It is excellent. Thank you. Thank you, Chair Greenberg, and I echo that sentiment also. Manager Valadez. Um, for the doctors that can understand this, about 18, 20 years ago, I did an unofficial study in the special education department over at uh, AISD. And I went by, this is when autism was first coming, cropping itself uh, into the system. And what I found is that if you lived west of 35, 
you were diagnosed by AISD diagnosticians as having autism. So you were entitled to the additional legislative supports. There are four pages you got in your in the development of your of your uh, IEP during the ARD process. If you lived east of 35, you were di di diagnosed as being emotionally disturbed with no supports, nothing. Now I want you to understand the anger I have lived with all these years by knowing that there was literally a 35 barrier was the difference between being autistic with all kinds of support, autistic with all kinds of supports or emotionally disturbed, entitled to nothing but a label in your files that went to your teachers and to the schools. That's what I saw. And what you all are doing is giving people hope for changing that. And I want you to know that if I could vote on, on, on funding you and giving you additional fundings right now, I would propose it. And I hope that, that we make that a part. I hope Jonathan, you've got that included there for, for this 2022 budget year, because this goes to the root of what children from zero to three experience due to poor training, poor education, and living in environments, uh, uh, what, whatever, um, and understand, uh, me understanding that you can exhibit the same behaviors and have the same effects, but it could be due to something uh, genetically uh, me or medically or psychologically uh, impacting you as a child. And either way, it doesn't matter that these issues will manifest themselves in these manners and that they can be addressed by a, a, an integrated, fully integrated system that's working with the governmental entities and the staffs to provide those best supports that the parents and the families and especially the children need so that they don't drop out because they were diagnosed as ED make poor choices in the streets because they don't have the capacity uh, or haven't had the lived experience to make a good choice. And they end up in a gang and then shot dead by police because I have witnessed that. So I want you to know that what you are doing is exactly what I think will help thousands of children and, and hopefully uh, closing that disparities gap is what we can do as quickly as possible. Because I live with that anger every day because I knew children and had to deal with their families during those times. Okay, so I, anyway, I applaud you and thank you. Thank could, you. I, could I just comment yeah. Ms. Valadez that um, a, similar, a similar misattribution or mis, misunderstanding about traumatized kids um, Traumatized kids are very threat reactive. They see right. and, and threat all around them. Uh, and, and, um, and that's just the way their nervous system is, is kind of wired at this point. And so they react in a way that is defensive and sometimes aggressive. And those right. kids are misunderstood as, as being oppositional or defiant or- um, culturally, culturally ingrained. And, yeah. and there's no such thing. A child is a child. <laughs> they need nurturing and love and understanding. And I want you, I want to thank you, Dr. Swanson and all of you, because you start with the child and grow into a homeless, homeless person dying in the street with incapable of even communicating maybe what they themselves are experiencing. So I, I thank you. Thank you, Dr. Swanson. Thank you, Manager Valadez. Those points were extremely poignant and uh, definitely appreciated. Um, Anyone else? Jonathan, I'm gonna turn it over to you to take us through part B. Sure. Uh, while we're pulling up the slide, I'll just also reflect that I, I think this work today really shows the impact of the strategic investments of this board in prior years. Um, it often takes several years to see these programs come to fruition, but I think you heard the 
behavioral health department at community care is you know about a year old and the MAT programs I think three are in in the fourth year now um, at community care and those are in large part due to the decisions and support of this board and in past budgets so uh, thank you all for your support and I uh, just wanted to add that that context um, <clears throat> so as a reminder these are the six clinical focus areas that we have uh, proposed for this year's budget. Uh, Alan and I are going to talk about the very last two. Uh, we're going to keep it very short because you've already heard some uh, great testimony on why transitions of care and clinical and patient education are important. These are cross-cutting. They apply to every service area. Um, Alan and I are going to speak very briefly on those and highlight a few specific initiatives, but uh, I would really just highlight that those, those two in particular are, are not going away. They're not going anywhere. They are gonna be multiple, uh, multi-year efforts for us. And in fact, they're gonna become um, embedded functions of our clinical services team under uh, Dr. Shalsha's leadership. So uh, with that, I will turn it over to Dr. Shalsha and we'll close us out with four more slides. Okay, thanks, John. If you can please go to the next slide. Um, I, I wanted to first start by really just thanking the Board of Managers again. I, I think for, for the feedback, for the openness, um, and just for the honest discussion, um, you know, to John's point, this is really systems planning and, um, and transitions of care. Um, you can see on the left-hand side, the blue-green environments are the ones that we focused on in the past and continue to work on. And transitions of care should just get more beefy, right? I mean, we should add on what we are doing, um, what we've done in the past, and we should build new environments for the future. The more we build transitions of care, the less the chance of our patients to fall through the cracks. And those cogwheels that we continuously refer to, we are slowly transitioning patients from one environment to the other um, to avoid them from falling through. And I think both you know, Dr. Weems um, and Swanson spoke to many of those transitions you know, that they and others have been working on, um, you know, to help our patients to, su to succeed. So in F FY22, congestive heart failure, there's a, a cohort of two to 300 patients um, that are discharged from the hospital that really need wraparound care. Um, they're at risk for readmission um, based at their, uh, at how critical they are and the fact that they, they need their coordinated care. And so we are focusing um, on those patients um, it has also become more evident that there are complicated um, patients that uh, carry um, uh, various um, infection diagnoses. Again, they are discharged and many of our patients are, are complex, either experience homelessness um, and are discharged with the need from either multiple antibiotics or for IV antibiotics um, and are frequently falling through the cracks because again, that wraparound service is not there. So we'll be focusing um, on that. The more we can concentrate on remote monitoring, the more we can in real time react to patient care and avoid patients um, from becoming more ill. Um, and again, just continue to move them to a, a world of better health and well being. Medical respite obviously is critically necessary. Um, we need a safe, um, uh, clean, dry um, environment for our patients when they are discharged from any of the care environments. Um, to basically heal in. And so we will be a medical rest, but I think we're gonna, we're gonna take a step towards this next year. And that is, I mean, our intent is really to, to keep building um, so that we can advance what we think of as medical respite. Um, for outpatient dialysis, um, our team has done a great job as far as um, either signing um, patients up for dialysis um, and for funding for dialysis when available. Uh, many of our patients still um, end up in the ED for what we consider compassionate dialysis, which is everything but compassionate dialysis. It is when patients are incredibly ill and have um, no other out and end up in the ED um, with a need to be dialyzed. Um, our teams have been working very hard to basically um, uh, gain access for our patients to an outpatient dialysis center, which is both predictable um, and more comfortable. It allows patients a better quality of life, allows them to continue working. And so their health and well-being is both increased in that environment. Next slide, please. I think our speakers today spoke um, on the importance of education. Um, it is central to everything we do. 
It should be both uh, team centric and patient centric um, as related to our teams, whether it's an enterprise team, um, whether it's central health um, or whether it is any of our enterprise partners, um, we will be concentrating, continuing to concentrate on, on health equity and implicit bias training. Um, in addition, um, education uh, happens both for the teams who are conducting the care and for the patients who are receiving the care. And so we are gonna be conducting a pilot study. Um, we're gonna hire a, uh, a dietitian or nutritionist and a couple community health workers. We do understand that, so the purpose to hire those three, the dietitian um, uh, has a certain specific knowledge that he or she will then be able to impart and share that information um, with the community health workers. The community health workers will have specific knowledge base based on the communities in which they're serving. And those community health workers can then imp impart that knowledge to the dietitian. And so we can then form this union of appropriate education that is culturally sensitive in order to be able to take the evidence-based information and get that to our patients in an appropriate way. We're gonna be focusing on very specific disease processes at first. So chronic kidney disease will be our initial um, uh, our initial go with this. And we then will be looking at, at, at heart failure, diabetes, and other initiatives. This is step one. Um, we do plan on hiring a clinical education manager. Um, again, we have shown the importance of education across the enterprise. And so starting to build our, educa our clinical education expertise to continue to be able um, to educate our teams and our patients to adapt to the current needs of the environment is central to everything we should be doing. In addition, we do understand that our enterprise partners um, have additional needs as far as dietitians. And so um, that will be uh, an additional initiative um, in the upcoming year. Next slide, please. John. So in the interest of time, I'm actually gonna end on this um, on this slide, Alan uh, already kind of outlined the, the work that we're trying to do in dietitian work that's on the next slide. And there's some additional information you all can uh, review at your leisure. Um, but really wanted to talk for a second about um, health equity and implicit bias training. Uh, this is training that is uh, separate. And in addition to the, the training modules and programs that we're looking at for our staff, uh, this is external facing and trying to support um, health equity and implicit bias or unconscious bias type training um, in our primary care home. So really supporting our, our partners. Um, so as we mentioned, there, there are a lot of areas where we can really focus on care team education. Uh, this is the place that we can start. Uh, you, you heard our guests talk about uh, motivational interviewing, about trauma-informed care. All of those are future year training opportunities for us as well, but this is really the place that we wanted to really kick off our um, care team focused education. Um, so in, in supporting this work, we, we really want to uh, allow for some flexibility so that this, this training may look a little bit different depending on which, uh, which primary care group um, that we're working with. That way we can really um, uh, create buy-in and hopefully create some sustainable programs so that these, this isn't just a, you know, a one-off type of training event. Uh, we do want to train at all levels, uh, but specifically, we want to focus on leadership. We want to focus on care teams and really anybody that is in a, a patient or public facing role. That could be a call center employee. That could be a front desk employee. That could be one of our eligibility screeners. Um, and this is really an acknowledgement that, that training comes at a cost. Um, that, that cost is direct in the form of uh, purchasing the training modules or bringing someone in to, to conduct the training. Um, but it also comes with a cost of bringing people offline. Um, that has a cost in terms of access and it has a cost in terms of revenue for our partners. Um, and, and we want to provide the support to encourage this, this continuous education for our, our care teams in the communities that are serving our patients. So I will um, end with that and we're certainly happy to answer any questions with our remaining time. Thank you, John. And uh, thank you, Dr. Chalsha. Um, open it up for any final questions, comments from the board members. 
not see manager mount very short all right you're you're muted you're muted i just want to thank you all all the presenters uh, for coming here and speaking to us today. And I really want to thank staff uh, and our board leadership. Uh, Sherry, thank you. And Dr. Bell, thank you. Uh, and, and Shannon for uh, making sure that we had the opportunity. You don't know how much I appreciate that uh, training uh, uh, option, not only for leadership, but I'm hoping leader, including in leadership, included in leadership is a uh, board. So thank you. Thank you. Okay. Well, again, I'd like to echo uh, Manager Valadez's uh, thank you for all of the presenters, the information. Uh, it was truly excellent. Um, as Manager Makwani said, um, I probably learned something every second that I li listened to you guys. So I truly appreciate um, all of the great information and uh, look forward to um, supporting uh, these ideas and activities with funds. All right, um, the final agenda item is agenda item number four, receive an update on central health dashboards associated with service level reporting for fiscal year 2021. Managers, the quarterly reporting dashboards are included in your backup for this meeting, so no presentation will be performed. Staff is available to answer your question today or on any day that uh, you would like to uh, address them to address your questions um, offline. So uh, just let us know what questions you have and we'll connect you with the appropriate staff. That being said, agenda item number five is to confirm the next strategic planning committee meeting date, time and location. Managers, our next Central Health Strategic Planning Meeting is scheduled tentatively for Wednesday, September 8th, 2020 at 1 p.m. at Central Health Administrative Offices, 1111 East Cesar Chavez Street, Austin, Texas, 78702, and or remotely uh, by video conference, depending on the status of the governor's disaster declaration and stay-at-home orders. At this time, I'm ready to accept a motion for adjournment. Uh, I have a motion by Manager Valadez. Do I have a second? I have a second by Chair Greenberg. Oh, no, uh, Chair made the motion. I seconded it. Okay. Chair Greenberg, yeah. motion. Uh, Manager Valadez seconded. Uh, any discussion? All in favor? Aye. Any opposed? Any abstaining? We are adjourned. Thank you very much, members. I Thank appreciate you, members. Thank you. And, uh, we'll see you again soon. Thank you. Good job, everyone. Will y'all let us know if we're going to meet in person or not? Yes, absolutely. Thank you. We'll keep you updated. We're working on processes. Thank you. Thank you.